Bases dropped on a Monday edition of Soccer Down Here. Yeah, we started a little bit late this morning. This whole spring forward thing is just so stupid. It didn't affect me as much yesterday. It did this morning when I overslept, and then you know, everything <laughs> happens. and You're scrambling around. You think you're good, and because everything is off, Gwen wants to go outside right before the show starts and not oh, yeah. usually an hour before the show starts. Then she takes her time, and then it's like, come on, rapido, rapido, and no, uh, nothing. So this is what happens. Welcome. It's soccer down here. Hi. Yeah, right there with you. you know, they, uh, they, the uh, animals who rule the roost are the ones that pretty much are the last to adjust to either spring yeah. forward or falling back. How are they supposed to know? Really? I mean, come on. They don't have a watch. They don't have a phone. No. This is a very good cover for you, considering I'm assuming you just spent the last 20 minutes making a not blood sacrifice to Diego Maradona after last night. No, 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 no. I'm not a Boca fan, first off, Jaren. Um, oh, no, no. It's not about being a Boca fan. It's about winning It's about winning the weekly line for soccer over there. Oh, I just take that as a given. That, that just happens. <laughs> I mean, I, I've won half of them, so I don't, I don't really need to do those sorts it's of things. 60% Jared. of them, sir. Um, well, okay, then that too. Um, I was Three just trying to keep it general, but sure, 60%, that's fine too. Um, I didn't quite get the full prediction on the Super Classico from Argentina, which we'll talk about this morning. Uh, I said three red cards, there were two. I was close. The 1-1 one, one did get. Uh, thanks for people hanging out on the Twitch pitch for the Gambetta yesterday. It was a lot of fun. It was a Fun, dramatic, ridiculous Super Classico, as we would all expect. That's what they are. Uh, the game in Mexico, the Super Classico, has some talking points. We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, Chivas legend, Bofo, is really talking trash about his Chivas players at the moment after a 3-0 thrashing by Club America. Santiago Solari, it's working pretty good for him these days. We'll talk about the weekend in Europe where you had some relegation-threatened teams stand up for themselves and uh, make a push and pull off some big wins. Uh, You also had Sheffield United finally announce that they were changing their manager, and it sounds like COVID protocols had something to do with it, and I don't know why, but anyway, uh, they did not really look like they appreciated the managerial change with a 5-0 spanking on the weekend. Uh, but we'll start with, because uh, we're, we're being yelled at in the Twitch pitch, um, with Alan Franco, who is being linked this morning on TEC with a move to Atlanta United. Um, we've talked about Alan Franco before on the show. There have been rumors, I want to say at least fairly consistently, about links to the LA Galaxy for Franco. Um, they obviously have not happened. He is still at Independiente. And the, the rumors that are out there are a $3 million transfer offer. And I don't think that is the 100% of the pass. Um, we'll, we'll see. There, there's, there's chatter at the moment. Um, you know, Alan Franco is a player who can fit in the system. He's a player who has been very good and very highly rated in, in the Argentine league system. Um, he was not the, the first choice. He is not as strong on the ball as Hector David Martinez is, who I wonder if he is maybe ruining the decision to go to River rather than come to Atlanta. Um, he did not start in the Super Classico yesterday. They went in a different direction. Um, little surprised about that. I, he, he should be playing. I think he'd make River's back line better because their back line's a huge issue, but that's a whole other topic. So Martinez was the first choice. He was, in my opinion, um, more athletic, a little bit better on the ball, better at carrying the ball forward. He played in a system that that promoted that. So, I mean, that's the other factor you got to include here, is he played in a system where you did that as a center back. Second option was Lautaro Giannetti, who did play on the weekend for Velez, um, still I guess they're going to cross their fingers and and hope that you don't have a recurrence of the knee injury that was spotted in the medical exam here. Um, Feels like they're rolling the dice. Velez was coming off of a 7-1 loss to Boca Juniors. They had won all their previous games in the Copa de la Liga. Um, You throw him back into the team because you kind of have to. They won on the weekend. He played pretty well. 
But he obviously would know the system inside and out because he played for Gabriel Heinze. So, okay, those were your first two options. Alan Franco has not played in a system that is structured the same way. So there's questions, you know, is, is he a guy who can adapt to being on the ball more? Is he a guy who can carry the ball forward and drive forward on the dribble a little bit? We don't really know. Um, the other two players were better fits because they had experience in systems like this. Franco is a highly rated center back, but can he adapt to playing in this way a little bit more? That's the part you just don't know until you get there. And uh, it was Augustin Edul of Teise, uh came out and said that Atlanta United offered 2.8 for 50% plus a future capital gain is how it's being phrased. Yeah, I mean, that can be an increased sell-on. That could be a lot of different things. Um, the, the other thing you got to factor in here with this is Independiente is not in a great financial position. So that will hurt their chances of wanting to keep him. They are in a good position in the Copa de la Liga, but it's a small tournament. So maybe they would be willing to, okay, take the hit, sell one of your starting center backs and move on. They do play three center backs. I don't know if... Uh, Falcioni, their manager, could adjust to a, a line of four as opposed to three center backs. Maybe that's one way to deal with the the absence of Franco. But the other factor is Independiente will be playing in the Copa Sudamericana starting in about a month's time, a little bit over a month. And that group stage will be completed before they get to the transfer window. Um, now, there is some question. Our, our Independiente correspondent, Gustavo, Um, has said there is a player they might be able to add at center back. Now, the window is closed in Argentina, but if you've ever paid attention to Argentine football, there are always, always things that can be done outside of the rules. Um, I don't know if this is a guy who would be available on a free, potentially, or a club would uh, let him walk on a free or whatever this would look like. I don't know. Um, We'll see if we can find out more about that. That would make it easier for Independiente to give up the player. It, it's a, it's a tough spot all the way around because as you know you you've got to understand Alan Franco was not the best fit for this edition. That's okay. It doesn't mean he can't work out, but he wasn't. It's going to be more of an adjustment for him than it would have been for Gianetti or Martinez because of their experience playing in similar styles. But he's a very highly regarded player. He's been linked with moves, especially to MLS in the past, but other leagues as well. And I think he has that potential. A little bit different kind of center back from what we've seen. Can he adapt and be comfortable playing in this way? That would be the the question mark, and that would be something you'd want to get him in as soon as possible to get him started in playing in that kind of way. Yeah, and that was what was running through my brain is that when you have someone like an Alan Franco, you want to get him in so he can get integrated, get comfortable, and understand the, the lay of the land when it comes to philosophy and his place in it. So, Jarrett, we've been doing this uh, do si round and round about center backs and, and joining Atlanta United. Um, what are your thoughts on this one, option number three with Alan Franco? Well, first of all, I'm just glad I got my card in the mail to, uh, to, to make it official. You know, I, I got to, uh, to pull the shredder out and shred the uh, Carmona replacement card and the Nagby replacement card, and now I have the center back card that I can carry around in my back pocket. Oh, yeah. Um, that's great. It's it, yeah. It's 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 a good time for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe now we can instead of worry about just straight replacements, go to the fact that not everyone's a straight replacement for everyone else. Oh yeah, They're different fits. There's that. Um, That's crazy. Be that as it may, I, you know, Paris the thought. <laughs> be that as it may, <sighs> somebody not being a perfect fit, it can still work, and somebody can develop skills and show you skills that they. What we what we decide is, you know, an undeveloped skill might be something that can be can be developed down the road. Hello, Mo Adams, who when Mo Adams came from Chicago, you're talking about a guy who played as a six is is viewed as strictly a destroyer, not someone you wanted to play on the ball. And I think he's shown that he can be that guy. Um, you're talking about bringing somebody who is a little bit older, admittedly, but who get him in the system and. It's not. I don't think it's. In, it's not. It's not out of the realm of possibility that you develop somebody's skills 
as necessary to play in the system, and they do just fine. It might not be a perfect fit in terms of other guys you might have been looking at, but it doesn't mean it can't work. Um, you know, you, you, like you said, it comes in very highly rated. Um, hell, some of the guys you brought in in 2017 were guys who just, frankly, they needed a shot. You know, LGP needed a shot just yeah. in the first place. I mean, he was not. Like, I I don't I don't know if this is a revision thing from some in some minds. He wasn't locking down 90 minutes a game in Argentina before he came here and showed what he could do. It's some guys just need a shot and maybe a shot in the new system to show he can fit in it. So um, at this point, I think you trust the scouting department to do what they have done very well. Yeah. A couple of questions from the the Twitch pitch that I'll try to consolidate here. Um, He's always been an Independiente player uh, developed there. Never went anywhere else. Um, there were links. I, I know at least one other time to the LA Galaxy, but last summer, um, in the midst of the pandemic, there were some pretty strong links there. He'd been linked to Club America uh, as well before that, I want to say in 2019. Uh, but he's never left. Um, you know how rumors can get. There's talk like, oh, he's gone. He's, a, he's an LA Galaxy player. Well, no, he's not. He's, he's really not. Um, so far in this Copa de la Liga, which is like a miniature league competition in Argentina, uh, he's played four of the five games for Independiente, started four of them, played 90 minutes in all of them. Just to give you a sense of the difference in the style of play that he's playing in right now, it's a more defensive style. Um, center backs in this kind of way of playing that Gabriel Heinze is going to want, you're going to be looking at 70, 80 touches, 60, 70 passes kind of situation. Um, Franco is averaging 29 accurate passes per game, 77%. Again, a little low. He's going long a lot more. Out of 29 accurate passes per game, 3.5 of them are long passes, long balls, over 25 yards. That's a lot. He's completing those at 41%. That's a little low. Again, you don't really have numbers up. You're not... The long ball that Alan Franco is hitting is not the targeted diagonal that you would see from the aforementioned Leandro Gonzalez Perez and others. It is more of a hit and hope kind of ball. So Franco's going to have to get reps. He's going to have to get time because you're going from looking to complete 29 passes a game to looking to complete probably in the, the realm of 60 passes per game. That's a lot. That's a, it's a different way of thinking. Now, defensively, very, very good. Um, he's been part of two clean sheets. Independiente has been very good defensively this season. They've committed numbers to it. Um, 1.8 interceptions, one tackle per game. You know, you've got two other center backs, so he's not the one who is always stepping up and winning those. He's the one who's going to sit back a little bit more, reads the game well. Uh, duels in the air, very, very good, winning 70% of those. That's big. You get that bonus. But he's just he, he's played in a different system, and, and I think that's the number one element here. He does have one cap for Argentina in the past, so that's your I mean that's your update right now on, on Alan Franco. That's where things stand. Uh, there are links, and it's being talked about now. Independiente is being featured on on Te Ise. They're talking about another win for the team, and that's the thing that makes it just a little. A little interesting is they're playing well. They do still have the financial issues hanging over their head that we have have heard about with players being owed money, clubs being owed money, to the point that, I mean, they've got to be coming up on this deadline pretty quick where they've got to make these payments or they're going to get banned from future transfer windows. That's what will likely push them here. And honestly, it's likely why Atlanta United turned to Independiente because there probably weren't many other teams who are willing to sell a starting level center back of this level quality right now out of Argentina. So he's got to be a player that Gabriel Heinze feels, yes, he's going to take more time to adjust because of the style of play he's coming from, but he can come good because of his quality. We'll put in the time to get him where we want to get him. Uh, Coco says it's interesting this rumor has gotten out as publicly as it has. Coco, welcome to Argentina. <laughs> um, this is <laughs> this is all come from Argentina because this is how these things go. Uh, 
Go back That's and look at how the Hawks are team no leaks. Argentina is team leaks. Oh, team leaks, big time team leaks. Um, and it, it could be the club, it could be the agent, it could be the player, it could be all of the above. Um, it, it's yeah, it's it's a whole different world. So this leak did not come from anywhere on this side of uh, the conversation. It's just how it goes. This is what happens. Go and look up Alan Franco and LA Galaxy, and you'll find a series of of links and articles and things about it. So. Uh, I always like to think the Barra Brava puts out a daily newsletter of all the leaks. Probably. Um, according to Sportia, it is a $3 million offer for uh, part of the pass for Franco. Um, that's just the crawl that they had up. So that's where it goes. We'll see. Um, he's a good player. I mean, he's, he's a very good player. He just comes from a little bit different background. So there, there will be a little bit of an adjustment period in playing with the ball at his feet more. That's it. That's the biggest thing here. May 2020 LA Galaxy link, February 2020 LA Galaxy link, January 2019, two teams in Major League Soccer linked to Alan Franco. So that's your that's your link history. There's and a lot more than that, trust me. It wasn't four people who said things at one time. It was every time there were probably 10 articles about it. Um, and I think there were even more than that, because I want to say there was an earlier one. And, and then that's not even getting into Club America, who was linked as well. Uh, Medio Tempo had a piece about it. And uh, Antonio says, Ruben Diaz was City's third center back choice this past window. I'll take that with Franco for Atlanta United. Yeah, and that's how it can work sometimes, you know? I mean, look, if you want to really go back in time here, Joseph Martinez was not the first option for Atlanta United. He came in after preseason and started. Worked out pretty good for him. Uh, Carlos Carmona wasn't the first option. He came in after preseason had started. Worked out pretty good for him in 2017, so... It's, it's what we've talked about. You have to then go back to the list, go back and see what you can do, and if you feel like that's the move you got to make, you go make it, and you go find the right spot. Um, Caps asks I, if we'll see a reporter in Argentina cornering Franco when he's getting in his car to ask if he's going to Atlanta. We will. Give yeah, it time. Mi- microphone in the window and everything. Give it time. It'll happen. That's just where, where it goes. Uh, Tafka says, uh, with Giannetti, it was no question he was going to be the distributor with Franco. Could that role be shared with Robinson, too? Stop, 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 stop. There's not a distributor. Throw that, throw that out. There's not a distributor. No. No. <laughs> no. Nobody is a distributor and somebody else is a passenger. No. That's not, no. Everybody's a distributor. Every player in the team has to be able to distribute. Every player. Defensively. Every one of the line of four has to. There's nowhere... I mean, you, don't, you, you can't share it. Like, that's not, how it, that's not how this works. Because you're going to build up at all times. So he's got to be ready to play with the ball at his feet at all times. No, don't, don't start that line of thinking. Nope. Go ahead and finish what, what else Tafka was saying. But let, no, no, no single distributor. No, no, no. no. Okay. Less, less predictable for opponents is either center mm-hmm. back taking on the responsibility. Well, that's, that's why you play that way. Because <laughs> you don't want it to be predictable. I mean, if there's one distributor. And, and again, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll drive the point home here. Giannetti would not have been the distributor, and Miles would have just been standing there with his hands in his pockets. They wouldn't have made special shorts for him with pockets to put his hands in and stand there while, during the buildup. Miles can play with the ball at his feet, too. Sosa would drop in and play with the ball at his feet. That's how you do it. You don't have one guy that is just there. You have to use all of them. Because what you're trying to do with that whole setup is you're trying to create numerical superiority. If the opponent is going to pressure, if they pressure, that's question one. If they pressure with one, if just the forward is stepping up to the center backs, 2v1, you can handle that all day. If somebody else steps up, and you see different teams do it, if it's the number 10 who steps up, if it's one of the wingers who comes inside to pressure, and it's two, okay, then the, the defensive midfielder drops back, it's 3v2. Again, you can do that all day. You work on that every single day in training. Okay, what if it's a front line of three, which is a much more difficult pressure to deal with? That's when you want four to deal with it. And you can do that a number of different ways. Sometimes it is the two center backs, your goalkeeper and the defensive midfielder, that create a diamond to play against three. That can work. Sometimes your outside backs have to drop deeper and help out. It's all about numerical superiority. But that means every single person involved has to be able to do the job. So there, there's no one distributor. Don't please don't get that twisted. Uh, 
Uh, John, you're muted. Good job. Oh, I, I went the other way. Okay, I thought I was muted, but I wasn't, but then I was muted, and now I'm not. Good job, okay. John. Welcome to Monday. And I think that catches us up on all of the, the early thoughts on Alan Franco on the Twitters. <laughs> See, I was waiting for John to like, I thought he was going to just go. I was like, oh, John's not. Oh, okay. I know. Well, I know. That's well, how it goes. Well. Um, okay, uh, Jarrett, <sighs> I'm going to have to ask you to be on Instagram duty because uh, Herman Garcia Grova, who is one of the heavyweights um, along with Cesar Luis Merlo, he tweeted a few minutes ago, FIFA ruled against a big club from Argentina. Details shortly on my Instagram. Jared, are you going to be our Instagram correspondent this morning? Yeah, yeah I can do that, man. It's been to like another probably 45 minutes if, if he has gone to the... <laughs> it might uh, be. If he has gone to the Cesar Luis Merlo school of Instagram usage. A lot of times, as we've said before, this is because they're putting out a whole story with it and they have to get everything done. Also true. Edited and set up. Um, While Chara, again, it's it's not as simple as as anybody's trying to make the way you play out of the back. I think anybody who's watched Manchester City, Barcelona, there's not one way. So it's not just the backs carrying the ball forward. It, you're going to try to get out down the flanks because that's the safest place to get out of the back. But that's not on. You go through the middle. There's not one way. You're not targeted on one thing. It's, it's not only one way to play. Um, I, I, just, I, I hope that there is not an idea that this is going to be a rigid way of playing because that's not what this style will look like you will always want numerical superiority in, in every part of the field that you have the ball because you always want more options to pass to than there are defenders. And wherever that is, you will take it. Sometimes it will be wide. Sometimes it'll be on the right. Sometimes it'll be on the left. Sometimes it'll be centrally. It's just there's not like one thing you do. I think that's just, you know, got to understand that. All right, we'll keep an eye on uh, Grova and see what he has to say. Uh, it, I mean, from what we know, that's got to be Independiente. Um, that's yeah. got to be more pressure on them to sell, and that's probably where all of this is coming from. It could be a situation where Atlanta takes advantage of a club who needs quick money because, I mean, they've, they've made some mistakes in the past, but it's not so much like Independiente went out and did you know, the Barcelona thing and spent a whole crazy amount of money on transfer fees and stuff. It's the fact they're broke, and it's the fact that they're not being run very well by the family in in charge of the club, and we saw that with the the Barco transfer back at the end of 2018, or end of 2017, beginning of 2018. It's, It's a bad situation with their board, and they've got them in the spot, but Alan Franco coming to Atlanta might be the way they get out of the spot, and and we'll see. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. Jared is on Instagram duty this morning. Um, hopefully you can still contribute to the show. I mean, it might be a while, Jared. We know how these things can go from time to time. It'll be fine. Okay, <laughs> good. I think you can handle it. Um, let's stay down in Argentina. And again, we'll keep you posted with everything with Franco. I mean, it's a rumor. It has started. It does, again, it checks all the boxes in terms of, yes, Atlanta's gone after center backs, going after another one, no shock. Um Yes, it checks boxes because Independiente needs to sell. Okay, got it. Let's see what happens. We'll keep you posted. Let's uh, let's talk Super Classico from yesterday, and it was about what you would expect. Um, it was at Boca. Boca sat and defended deeper. River had runs of play where they looked great. Um, you give up a bad penalty, and it is converted. Not in the greatest away by Visha, but it was converted down the middle. Then it looks like Boca's going to handle it. River with a great equalizer, the header from Palavicino, um, world-class header, to get it to 1-1. Then you get red cards. Then you get a sequence where, I mean, we were talking about it on the Gambetta. When you see the replays of this, it's like a, a half chance that's it's put on towards goal from River. Goalkeeper's beaten everybody's beaten. There is a little bit of spin on the ball. It did not look like the amount of spin that would take it to bounce, I believe, twice, and then spin back about a foot from the the goal line away from the goal, and then Andrada recovers and makes an incredible save. I have no explanation for how that happened, and it's 
all the memes started immediately. I, I said they would. Um, it was at La Bombonera. There is a, uh, whatever we want to call him, uh, a patron saint of, of Boca Juniors um, named Diego Maradona, who uh, you can go look up at the memes. I mean, all the major outlets were talking about it and, and posting the memes of Diego Maradona keeping the ball out of the goal <laughs> and keeping it at 1-1. <laughs> There's not really many better explanations because it didn't look like there was enough spin on the ball for it to do that. It just made no sense. The most beautiful part to me is even Marcelo Gajardo kind of giving tribute to that concept of, like, (laughs) he's not going to say anything bad. He knows not to tempt the fates because the fates have just thrown their hand in. No. Yeah, you just... You just take that one and go. Yeah, just just take it. Don't be mad. Don't say anything that might create another uh-huh. uh, another miraculous event against you. Yeah, it it was is one of the crazier things I've seen because you see it live, and I think like I paused watching it live. I'm like, it's it's in it, it it's what, and, and then it's just <laughs> it's this confusion of what 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 happened. And you see the first replay, and you're even more confused. And then you see it like slowed down and isolated, and you're even more confused because it doesn't make sense. No, but that's Argentina, it, and that's the Super Classico. It's just, and then when you, it, I, in looking at the slow mo, you just sit there, and the ball is just rotating and doing its thing, and it just, it's, you're you're mesmerized by that whole chain. And literally, I was I looked at it on replay, looked at it live speed. Then you look at it replay, and no, I, I, I will be another one of those that sits there and just accepts the explanation that uh, Diego Maradona was was involved. More power to him. Anybody that's got an issue with it, you talk to the man. That's all I'm saying. That's that's it because that's the only explanation I have for something like that happening on a day like that in an event like that. So um, I'll take it and go. I mean, it takes one bounce, it takes a second bounce. The first bounce, it doesn't even look like it changes direction. Mm -hmm. The second bounce is inches from the goal line, and it spins back. And then then the part that, I mean, is getting left in this is Andrade's at the top of the six on the first bounce. He scrambles all the way back back to make a kick save on the near post, which is incredible. Um, Armani, the goalkeeper for River, had a series uh, of big saves. The goalkeepers were huge in this game, but maybe the ghosts were too. Yeah, so um, yeah, for me, I know that uh, in, in looking and listening as I was, as I was drifting through, I was not a part of the Gambetta yesterday, but uh, you know, Tevez had a chance, I think, in the 36th. Then you had the the penalty happen in the 40th. Then you have what happens in the second half. I would not have expected uh, anything else other than uh, you truly getting the perfecta and having more reds than goals. You were that close to getting the whole perfecta again for yet another big match. Yeah, I was really close. Um, Well, no, I had a trifecta in the, the Der Klassiker. I was going for the perfecta here and almost got it. Not quite. All right, I think I have the video, and I'm going to pull it up in the the Twitch stream from our friend Roberto Rojas, who posted this. So we can all marvel at um, ghosts and such. If this wants to work, and I think it will. So here we go. Let's push that up now. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. All right. I'm going to make that just a little bit bigger for everybody to see. All right, so here's the overhead shot. It it hops. <laughs> it did move a little bit more in that first bounce, but then the second bounce it comes all the way back. Look at the spin on the ball. It's not like rapid spinning. That's I mean, what's crazy it's, about it. It takes a 30-degree angle off that second bounce. It, it's not some rapid English on it. It took a bigger bounce on the first hop than I thought. Maybe that was where uh, the ghost was coming into play initially. Marcelo Gajardo is just like, what, what? Mm-hmm. Raquel May doesn't even react because he knows. <laughs> R- Raquel May knows being one of the, the board members at Boca. He, he knows what's going on. 
It's incredible. I'll, I'll let it run one more time so you can take a look. Um, and then we've got a quick Scotland question for you, Jarrett. Um, this yeah. is a disgusting morning. I know, I know. I'm sorry. I don't like being reminded. This, this, this non-goal probably kept me from being in third place instead of dead last in the soccer over there weekly, uh, weekly guessing gambit. And it, it hurts my feelings. That second bounce is absolutely insane. Because, I mean, you can see the ball spinning, and there is spin on it, but it's not that Ain't much. That much it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> it makes no sense. Like most everything about Argentine football, it's amazing. Uh, it's crazy. Okay, Byrne says, uh, since Jared's still on, quick Scotland tidbit, and this is um, national team stuff for you, Jared, so you can you can relax a little bit. Austria will have to travel to Scotland for their game without seven starters, all Bundesliga players. Scotland refused to switch to another venue. It's one way to keep your coefficient high, isn't it? One good way to keep your coefficient high. Again, Austria is one of the ones they're dealing with here, right, in the coefficient battle. Yep. Uh (laughs) That's horrible. Yeah, that's a dog fight. That's horrible. (laughs) Jared, come on now. What's up with your Scots? they're just tooth and nail every which way they can get a point and drag this thing higher and higher they will. They're kind of in that situation right now and haven't been in that situation in a long time. Yeah. Thanks, Rangers, for winning games because that's been huge. Yeah. It's been good. Um, your, your, your green and white team didn't help too much with that. Uh I didn't really. I mean, there comes a certain point in the season where you're like, I'm not going to do anything. All right, the blue team is going to have to actually like carry this thing across the line for us. But um, again, we're still getting closer and closer to Scotland playing England in a match that matters. And I just, I need to find what the bet is going to be for the over under on cards in that game. Take the over. Doesn't matter. Yeah, pretty much. That's going to be absurd. Um, got a couple things popping off this morning. So the official fixture list has been announced for the Copa America in South America this summer. Um, no guest teams are being invited. Australia and Qatar had to drop out because of rearranged World Cup qualifiers and, and games and such. So it will start on June 13th. 13 matches will be played in Argentina, 15 in Colombia. The final will be in Barranquilla in Colombia. There were some talk that it could move to Colombia or move to Argentina. There was some talk about everything moving to Argentina at one point. It's not. It's still going to be split between Argentina and Colombia, at least for now. Uh, June 13th start, July 10th final is the plan for the Copa America. So I'm guessing, with not changing anything with that, that the plan will be to squeeze in the two rounds of qualifiers that they were not playing, or not going to play this month, because they stopped. Uh, Europe will continue with qualifiers, which is going to get even more complicated than Scotland trying to uh, win the coefficient battle with Austria. They're going to have to squeeze them into the fall, where you have CONCACAF and, and others, I believe Europe is doing this as well, playing three games in a window. That's the only place it can fit because you just don't have the dates. You're out of time to squeeze it in at the end, which would be next summer, which I think is where you need to have your playoff for your fifth place team from Comma Ball to play another Confederations qualifier in a playoff to go to the World Cup. You're just running out of time. So I think you're going to have a very packed-in fall which we've talked about schedule compression. We've talked about the effects of this on, on players. National team players are going to get hit really hard in September and October worldwide where they're playing three games in a window. I hope national team managers, even though it's going to affect more players, I hope they call in bigger rosters because expecting these guys to play three games in that window, all three, is going to be really rough. The teams that have depth are going to be the teams that, I think, handle it well. Yeah, no doubt. And especially with especially with that schedule compression, if you're going to have three in a window, that, that for me, depth is going to be key here in making sure that 
you can get through in one piece and chase the results that you're hunting for. But yeah, that's going to be a tall order for everybody. Yeah, that's going to be a challenge. Um, we had a question for a link to the ghost goal, and I will post that in for Kismet. Uh, Burns not worried about missing their Premier League players uh, for qualifiers. They're playing Iceland. Shrug, according to Burned, which would be accurate. Um, also this morning in the news front, and this affects Real Madrid, who had a big win on the weekend. Um, it took them a while. <laughs> they, they, they had to, the, the suffer and struggle in this one. But they found a way through. Karim Benzema with a, a beautiful winner. Eden Hazard came back in that game. And it's like, okay, he's building back up. Sergio Ramos played in the game and, and played pretty deep into it. But Eden Hazard, it's like, okay, he's, he's getting fit. He's going to be all right. Nope, he is out. He did not train today. He is not playing in the Champions League this week against Atalanta. I just, it's like every single time you sit there and you think that Eden Hazard is returning and he's going to be putting in quality minutes, there's always that speed bump that happens. And I don't know how long this speed bump is going to be, but it is just another hiccup in his term at Real Madrid. You know, there was there was so much promise attached to it and everybody was in there thinking, okay, let's, you know, looking forward to seeing this next stage for him as he left Chelsea to go to Real. It's just been a hiccup and a hiccup and a and a speed bump and now here's your new one. New muscle injury could be out four to six weeks, according to reports. He played 15 minutes on the weekend. Mm. Yeah. Um, this week, Champions League, you've got Manchester City, Amolchen Gladbach in the second leg. Uh, where is that one again? Is it Budapest? Budapest sounds good. Real Madrid and Atalanta, those are your Tuesday matches. Wednesday in Champions League, it is Bayern Munich hosting Lazio, and it is Chelsea hosting Atleti. Chelsea Atleti will be fun, 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 fun. Mm -hmm. um, Atleti, eh, they had a little bit of a slip-up, um, which means the door is open in La Liga. Atleti has a six-point lead at the top on Real Madrid. Barcelona plays today. They can cut that to a four-point lead if they win today. And they should win today. They are playing, or they are hosting Huesca, who is in 20th. Barcelona should be okay and cut that to four points. Last weekend, it felt like Barcelona was the big weekend winner. They could end up being the big weekend winner again. Just under a minus 600 going up against Huesca. Huesca is a plus 15.59 in your juice boxes, and your draws at plus 720. Uh, Will had a question about the South American World Cup qualifiers. Could you just have Copa America games double as, as qualifiers? And no, you, you can't because they're at neutral sites, and teams aren't going to agree to that first off. Uh, I don't think FIFA would allow it either. They, they, I, I can't think of a situation where a another competition – their games doubled as a, a qualifier because it'd be some doubling as qualifiers, but not all. So it just you can't really do it that way. Um, and you've already started the qualification round, so you can't throw those games out and just have like the top four from this tournament go. Like, yeah, there's just no way to make it work. Um, I do appreciate the uh, the creativity, and in South America, they do get creative sometimes. But I don't think FIFA would allow that one. So. Um, Sam Williamson asked, who's hurt more, Neymar or Hazard? Hazard for sure. Neymar is sometimes hurt with air quotes because it is yes. uh, a, a certain party being held in a certain part of the world that is not Paris. Um, hurt with air quotes is more of Neymar, and hurt for real is Eden Hazard. <laughs> so yes. That's kind of where I'm at. Uh, <laughs> we, we have a question. So who is Barcelona playing today? Uh, Barcelona is playing Huesca. Huesca? Huesca. Okay. Can you say Cool uh, Whip and Whip? Cool Whip and Whip. Okay. That was what Mizano wanted to hear. I, I think you, maybe you were a little strong on the W with uh, Huesca. Huesca. It's not a W. It's Huesca. It's not a W. It's not, it's not a W? No. There's no W there. Huesca. Sure, we'll, we'll go with that. 
I don't think it ever changed. But anyway. Well, I still uh, we have a uh, Huesca Instagram update. We have an Instagram okay. update. I don't have a sounder for that. Instagram update. That's not it. Um, that is like not that. it at all. No, <laughs> that's, that's okay, horrible. That's, <laughs> Instagram update with Jarrett Smith. Yeah, uh, from uh, Hernan. Uh, we have a new FIFA ruling against CAI. That is independiente for those of you playing the home game over a transfer of uh, Carlos Benavides. Benavides. Is that a new one to uh, the list? Two, it might be. Two unpaid bonuses of $100,000 U.S. Independiente will appeal to TAS. CAS. Uh, TAS already condemned. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, remembering that they already condemned Herojo and another failure to pay and may suffer the penalty of removing points and signing restrictions. So it is an entirely new. Issue. It is a new player to the list. I think there were one. I think it was one player and two clubs that were previously on the list. So I think we're two and two now. Yeah, that's yeah. I think you're two and two. That's not good. Mm, um, no. you're probably gonna not have for to sell. No, yeah, you're, um, you're it's probably, probably good if you are a club who is looking at players in Independiente. Uh, it could be good in that case. Yes, um, not just Atlanta. Other clubs might be. Like peeking around the corner now. Well, saying, hey, what do you got that you're willing to? I don't. No, I don't think it's quite that bad because if you get three here, because it, it, none of these are like massive amounts, if I remember correctly. What was the amount? Oh, yeah, here? no, it's it's like this one's a uh, hundred or two hundred thousand. Like it's so six figures. It's a large amount in the universe, but yeah. not like to you and me. It's a large amount. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But not I, I don't have that universe. laying around. It's if, an inconvenience to them. If you're about, it, it's about to be a big inconvenience because you're going to be blocked from transfer markets. But if you're going to get a three million dollar check, then you're going to have some money left over after paying off your debts. Is what it sounds yeah. like. <sighs> well, that's that. Okay, um, a lot of back and forth about pronunciation down here. Um, a little <laughs> yeah, more like Wesca. It, it, it's like ooh. Wesca. Oh, like There's Wesca. no W in it. That was, I think, where it was getting off the rails, John. Okay, so Wesca. So basically the H Ooh. would be silent if I was looking at the it. The H is yeah. always silent, yeah, yeah. So Wesca. But, but okay. yeah, you were going hard W, and I don't know where that was coming from. Wesca. No, 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 that's, no. But that's what, I'm, that's what I'm saying. You're saying that's what I was doing. Yes, okay. Because when I kept telling you, no, don't do that, you did it again and again and again. That's where I was confused. Okay. It was almost like you were pronouncing it like Waleska. That's yeah, not, which is yeah. really not the same place. No, no. No, not at all. Uh, but, the, it, yeah, it, when you said it the first time, the Cool Whip thing kept popping into my head, too. <laughs> yeah. Just, just well, like, people really have another one. Um, who is the actor from Star Trek, I believe the TV, because I'm not a Star Trek fan. I'm sorry. I apologize to all the Star Trek fans. Uh, who would constantly show up on Big Bang Theory, John? Oh, uh, oh, Will Wheaton. There you go. People wanted you to say that, too. Okay, Will Wheaton. Uh, according to, uh, we were talking about Ed Nazar just a second ago. Yes. <laughs> from uh, Nico Contour, since joining Real Madrid in 2019, Ed Nazar missed 320 days and 50 games with injury, reportedly out another four to six weeks. Yeah, the four to six weeks is what we, what we said a minute ago from uh, Express Football. They have it. Um, it's not looking good for Eden Hazard for helping Real Madrid as they try to chase the title. But, you know, Atleti is only two losses on the season, but they're just stuttering right now. In their last five, they're two wins, two draws, and one loss, whereas you look at Barcelona, four wins and, and one draw. Uh, even Real Madrid, three wins and two draws. I mean, Atleti is is keeping that door propped open, and Barcelona is going to cut it to four points today. And Lionel Messi is still on one. He is having a a big season. Um, they might be able to find a way back into this thing. It, it's it, I would have never guessed it, but man, the tides have turned for Barcelona. You get. The game today against who, John? Wesca. You just did it again. No, I did not. Yes, you did. What Uesca? Oh, so it's, oh, so so you, okay. Uesca. How about that? Yeah, it's it, it it's very 
exaggerated, but yes, you didn't go W that time, so that's good. No, I didn't go W that time. I'm trying to avoid my W. Yeah, but you could still, you, you had Oesca. 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 Okay. Uh, Real Sociedad is the next one for Barcelona, and that is on the road. Um, Barcelona does have a Clasico, a Super Clasico, if you will, with uh, Real Madrid on April 11th. That's after they host Valladolid. You could pick up nine points in the next three if you're Barcelona pretty comfortably. You have that game with Madrid. You host Atleti on May 9th. Mm. Burned is giving you some props on the pronunciation. He says to him it sounds correct. Um, it's like huevo. I, I think burn for me, like when it first started, it was very strong in the W sound that that shouldn't have been there. But yeah, I think maybe we're getting into semantics a little bit. <laughs> but also, don't then over exaggerate. Uesca either. Uesca. You do it fast and plow through it, and you're good. Just don't add a W. That's all. Yeah. Uh, this is oh, what happens the record. with pronunciation, yeah. y'all, because yeah. everybody has their own like way of saying things, and it's very hard to speak a language that you didn't grow up in, um, and little things will be very difficult. Uh, I'm I'm learning it. I mean, I, I don't get things right. I don't get a lot of it right. I'm trying to get you know kind of the next level of, of continent, consonant sounds correctly, and it's tough because it's so different from English. Like I, I saw, I guess the best way to explain it that kind of made my head snap in is um, a story about a woman who I believe was from Colombia and her name is M I R I A M. She's Colombian. And everybody here in the United States would say Miriam. Right? That's what right. it looks like. That's what it would be in English. But her name would be pronounced, and, and this is tough for me because it's, it's like re-engineering it, Midium. The R sounds more like a W, or sorry, not a W, to a, a D, to the yeah. point that you would have her tell people, no, my name is Medium. Like Medium. Mm-hmm. Like not <laughs> big, small, not medium. Small or large. Medium. But... Because that is closer to the correct pronunciation. It's tough. You know, we, we all do the best we can. Um, there's very few people who can properly pronounce every language in the world. <laughs> Maybe Derek Ray is one of them. Yes. Um, okay. We will take more questions. We will get into more things from around the world as well. Um, we do have a On This Day coming up here in just a minute. We have also John's Big Read. <laughs> Oh, uh, you were mentioning Atleti in uh, Chelsea midweek in Champions League. Atleti right now is a plus 250 heading to Stamford Bridge. Chelsea's a plus 123. Yes. Now everybody so is, is going around and around. Kate Abdo's pretty good, Katie Weaver. Um, Kate Abdo's pretty good with her pronunciation as, as well. I, I'd, I'd like to hear her on the, um, I maybe the Scandinavians. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's the trickier one, but German and, and Spanish and English, that's oof, that's pretty good. A um, lot of people throwing advice now <laughs> in the Twitch pitch, and it's getting out of hand. Um, madness. It, we're all trying is the best way to put it. Just let's, let's do that. Let's all try. Uh, John, I will ask you uh, real quick on, the, on this day. This guy was born on this day. He's part of a very famous band. Who was the band who had the massive hit, We're Not Gonna Take It? Oh, Quiet Riot? No. Oh, sorry, that's no, the, oh wait, Twisted Sister. Everybody sorry, does that. Yes, it's Twisted Sister. Their lead singer, D. Snyder, was born on this day in 1955. Um, one of the dumber things on this day, because this is pretty dumb, <laughs> uh... This band kind of became a, a joke over time. Uh, Jerry, did you you were you're bigger into punk than I was? Did you ever like The Offspring, or were you not a fan? Yeah, yeah, you, I like The Offspring. Okay, two thousand. I'm eternally upset because everyone wanted to get drunk one night at a three eleven show instead of seeing The Offspring open. I didn't give a damn about seeing three eleven. Oh, okay. Three eleven fans are going to be upset with Jarrett now, but that's okay. Uh, Bring it. Had a whole had a whole Lakewood full of them. <laughs> Wow. Uh, well, Blink-182, Mark Hoppus was born on this day in 1972 to continue in the pop-punk world. 
But in 2003, uh, The Offspring announced that their new album would be called Chinese Democracy. Remember, Guns N' Roses had been talking about putting out that album for like 10, 15 years or something. <laughs> it took 20 years to put that album out. Yeah, and Dexter Holland, the lead singer from Offspring, said, Axel ripped off my braids, so I ripped off his album title. Wow. So lame. Damn. What a stupid slap fight. Wow. That he ripped, he ripped off my braids, so I ripped off his album title. Yes. At least Dexter Holland used his free time to get his pilot's license instead of being Axl Rose. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, John, you about ready for this thing? Sure. Okay, that, that didn't sound all that excited. John, you about ready for this thing? Sure. Okay, yeah, you're still stretching. That so. doesn't sound any more excited. I know. It, it just sounded like he was in insane. mid-stretch. Yeah, I'm in mid-stretch. How many times can you crack your knuckles? We need to see a doctor. Well, it's not like it's not like the old days, you know, when you could sit there and you tried to take one hand and press it against your back knuckles and you try to sit there and make that noise with all of them and crack all of it and get all the air out. That's what they would always say. You're just, oh, you've got air between your knuckles and your bones, and that's what you're doing. You've got air between your knuckles? Yeah, like you've stretched it like, yeah, you've never heard that. I mean, like I've never heard that expression. No, you never heard you never heard of the the idea of air pockets in between your knuckles and stuff, and that's what's making the noise all the time. Nope. Wow. Okay. Oh, okay. I've never really explored the uh, popping of knuckles to that degree, though. So, I mean, you know, sorry. Maybe it's just us then. I think it is just us. I've never really been a knuckle popper. I, I haven't either, but you're. But then you sit there and you make the noise, and it, you're sitting there going, "Oh, how did that happen?" And then you're kind of drawn to try to make the noise all over again. But it's well, it's also I, I damaged my hand so much, you know, taking taking ground balls. Yeah, oh yeah, baseball absolutely that, would do that. That mine, like I can just I can just like curl my fingers in and they pop. Mm-hmm. So that's my yeah. ankle, pretty much. Yeah, it's not good. I can rotate my ankle, and it's just pop, 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 pop. And it's not yeah. because there's air between anything. It's just because it's because of catastrophic injury. <laughs> yes, it's it's because my ankle is silly putty at this point. Around bones that pop. Anyway, yeah. all right. Anyway, let's get this read. I'm excited. Okay, Jarrett's excited. Um, let's do this. Oh wait, no. Okay, John, you got to do this because we have breaking news on the other side. I think possibly, maybe possibly. You ready? Okay. Go. Yes. Apolinsky and Associates, LLC, proud supporters of everything soccer down here in the SDH network for wrongful death and serious injury matters. There's only one place you need to go, and there are three different ways that you can do it. One, get a phone call over to Steve, 404-377-9191. You can use your mobile or you can use your landline. I know folks have landlines because they can do it. We have them here at Office HD. Two, shoot Steve an email. Get a free consultation that way. steve at aa-legal.com. Three, the internet's. Large device or small. Address bar, aa-legal.com. Hit the enter key, the return key, the arrow key, whatever advances it to the homepage. A lot of information on said homepage for Apolinsky and Associates LLC. Trust me, there's a lot of information. And if that lot of information isn't enough information for you, you can get your questions answered with a pop-up window, because that's what pop-up windows do. They pop up 24-7, 365 and a quarter. Thank you, Chris Hutchison. Recognized as Legal Elite by Georgia Trend Magazine for being one of the top 100 firms in this here state of Georgia. For clients in Georgia and Alabama, over 30 years of experience, over $40 million in judgments for those clients. One place you need to go for wrongful death and serious injury matters. The website is aa-legal.com. What's the breaking news? Yunus Musa's in. He's going to play for the United States. That is the breaking news. Woo-hoo. That's bigger than a woohoo. I mean, that that's good. That that's that, that, that's that is. good. It's when the English squad came out two hours ago and his name was not on it. His he was never going to be in the English squad, John. That, no, that that's look. That's why he picks the United States here. He was never going to play for the English squad straight away. He would have went into their U twenty ones or whatever, and that's how they do their things. He's got an opportunity to play straight away with the United States. He's building a young core, and Greg Berhalter did an amazing Cruton job here, and he gets Yunus Musa, and that was the video that the US MNT just posted. Very, very cool. All right, we'll talk more about that in a second. We got scores on John's manic read to fit a manic Monday, which was appropriate mm-hmm. because we had news to get to. Uh, Jared, what did you think, first off? Uh, well, he started at an 8.5 off the bat because he did not put HTTPS yes. in the yes, actual web address. Colon so double backslash. 
<laughs> yes. Because that wasn't there, we're starting from an eight point five. Um I give it a I give it a, a seven. Um it was good. It was it was a little quick for my liking. Um it was a little more smile on the back end of it. Um So you're I'll saying it's a that. crappy dunk, basically, in the dunk contest. It's a decent dunk. It's not gonna win it's not gonna win you the trophy, but you also got it in the rim on the first try, which is more than I could say for half the people in the dunk contest. Uh, you got a minus one for a thumb wag. Um, I did not, when did I wag my thumb? I don't know. I wasn't watching. I was preparing. I did, the, I did the pen wag. I didn't do the, I didn't wag my thumb because that would be kind of, that, that's anatomically impossible. That's why you got a minus one. Uh, nobody cares about hardwired landlines. That's a zero. Oh, I would beg to differ. There are folks on the Twitch pitch who have landlines, sir. Do they care about them though? Really? If they if they have them, they obviously care. There's like five of you who have landlines like left. It's like a payphone. They're they're like they're me and my AOL account for email. Yes, that too. Um, uh, Katie said I called it a nine point oh seven. That this was going to be a speed read, or at nine oh seven, this was going to be a speed read. Um, it well, it wasn't a speed read because of anything that happened earlier because we were on Turner time. It was a speed read because. We had some news to get to that had just dropped, so that, that was why. Um, there was a reason for the speed read. Uh, despite the Micro Machines read, 7. Uh, confident, efficient, a 9. I, I think the faster read was better. Um, Sam wants the pre-recorded John, a 7. Oof. <laughs> uh, a 7. A plus 2 for the SDH NWO full zip. A minus 2 for the air pockets and the knuckles. Thank you. A minus three for me rushing, John. You can actually blame Johannes. He's the one who, who said the breaking news in the Twitch pitch. So it's, it's his fault, not me. I'm just trying to shift the blame. Uh, minus four <laughs> to you for obliging. A minus three for if that lot of information isn't enough for you. Oof, yeah, that's, that's kind of clunky. Uh, total score, a 3.14. Well, it was Pi Day yesterday, so I understand. That was that. yesterday, though. Well, we didn't have a show yesterday, so. He gets leftover pie, basically. Yes. Um, jumbled mess this One morning. Week without a show. Yeah. Three jumbled mess plus two for the sped up recovery plus two for the the no dot com. So that brings you up to the seven no dot com pause. So that brings you up to the seven for Mizano. Minus five going so fast I can't even keep up. Minus two <laughs> for the landlines comment. Minus two. Uh, for the no dot com pause, so Sean wanted the dot com pause, and you get a point zero eight nine seven. Okay. See, I'm more on this one. Six point nine, efficient and nice. A seven point one one, a five point four, six point five, and on the read, a ten in our hearts, according to Mile High. Uh, six point two five in honor of being kind. Oh, that's kind. Wow. Um, I was gonna say, what would Alex Pacine say if that was kind? Uh, five hundred and twelve. Um, a ten. The faster, the better. I, I tend to agree. When you start to meander, it gets out of hand. Um, before the read, you did the thumb wag, uh, according to Joe. Um, seven for the power read, leading to the breaking news. Minus two, though, for that Eunice Musa pitiful woo, so that brings you down to a five. That was after the read, though. I mean, right I, what? I mean, I haven't been this excited about a Musa since UGA in the early 2000s. Wow, so you're going ah. way back. You're going way back on that one. John, what are you doing to your thumb? Could you stop? I'm trying to figure... I'm trying to figure out how I waved my thumb. Just, just stop. Just, just go with it, please. It's, it's really disconcerting. Stop it. The, this, this, the speed was the speed would caught me off guard. But as someone in a past life who had to do triple team traffic with a bunch of lunatics who spoke at an unhealthy speed, yeah, it made yeah. I, I can I can understand what he's saying because if I hadn't been able to, I'd have already died by now in a past life. But it was still fast and caught me off guard for a minute. I had to readjust. Learning but about two, why. yeah, learning about two car insurance seminars up at the Dunwoody family. No, I get that completely. Yeah, it was it was by request to go fast, and I thought it was good. I think your reads are generally better when they go fast. Uh, I'm with Ricky Ricardo on this one, though, about Musa. If you're going to lose Efren Alvarez to Mexico, uh, this is a win, and it, it's no knock on Efren Alvarez, but people were were getting in their feelings about that one and. <sighs> Yeah, you want everybody possible, but he's not playing over some of the guys you have. Eunice Musa can play over some of the guys in the pool. 
I think the upside is far more with Yunus Musa. If I got to pick one or the other, taking Yunus Musa. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's very good, and it's good for the long term. He's got time to develop and grow. So this is another good get. Um, where is uh, Greg Berhalter on the recruiting scale, Jared Smith? Doing pretty well. Um, I don't know where he is on the scale. Um, he ain't exactly saving, but he's uh, doing a really good job. Mm-hmm. He's, he's, flipping, flipping, he's flipping a lot of them crews, ain't he, Jared? He's flipping enough of them crews that we're going to start like getting requests for internal investigations. But can, do you really need to have that when it comes to this? I mean, this is FIFA we're talking about. I think there's always the question for me as like, um, you know, yeah, you should be able to get these guys that you're getting because even though the United States is is, is a is a program that needs to be re, you know, kind of get some. I don't say I don't I don't want to say rebuild, but you're trying to kind of repair the reputation after what happened going into the last World Cup. It is still a matter of doing it, doing the right thing and getting the guys that you want in the system and it, and at the end of the day you're getting all these guys in a system it, here's the thing not all of them are going to come good but the more of these high upside guys you get better chance you have that a, a efficient number of them come good because that it, it's like recruit it's like it's like college recruits at, at that point i mean because you are bringing in young guys who have a lot of potential they don't always work out that's just the way it is and you might think you have, you know, the next great American soccer player, and he just might not pan out. And it might be somebody else who who blossoms a couple of years late. But when you're getting tons of these guys, and full credit to Greg for pulling guys in, you're getting dynamic players with high upside. Enough of them come good. You can cause havoc with that. Okay. And it's a lot better than sitting there complaining. I'm, I'm going to ask you guys to uh, rank the recruiters, and here's your recruiters to rank. John Calipari, Greg Berhalter, Kirby Smart. Hmm. I'll go in that order. You're going to go Calipari first? Yeah. Um, doesn't he because get dinged he'll, I'll, for I'll being get... in trouble in multiple places? For said recruiting, guys, guys get more show causes than he knows what to do with. But yeah. he also has titles. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you got more, caught. If Derek Rose could hit a free throw. He should have won a title at Memphis. Yeah, yeah. they would have taken it away, so it wouldn't really matter. It wouldn't. Well, I, I, and I also think that Calipari was one of the first ones that embraced the idea of the one and done. <laughs> he definitely did that, and understood. I it's like, remember Shashevsky being like, "I'll ne- we'll never do that. Like that's not something we would do." And then like. <laughs> Three years later, Hi, like, Zion. Krzyzewski's pulling, Krzyzewski's yeah. pulling one and done's left and right, and winning titles doing it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for me, uh, Kirk, Kirby is third because of, first and foremost, you know, wanting to sit there and close the borders, and then you don't. And, you like, one, look, one third of, just as an example, one third of Auburn's roster is from the state of Georgia. And if you wanted to make a concerted Auburn's effort, basically West Georgia. Anyway. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. Yeah. The, it is. It is. Well, John, but, I, I think when he says close the borders, he's not saying if you don't come to Georgia, you're not allowed to play sports anywhere ever again. No, I know. It's not like he's no, going but, without players here. No, but what you're doing is put it, down the you, Auburn flag, you John. I'm an ACC guy first and foremost. Uh huh. You cape for Auburn so hard in this. No, no, no. They no, have no, a Georgia no. player, so Kirby can't say he's trying to close the borders. Look, no, Kirby. Kirby can't keep enough of the five stars here in this state. The the players are not the problem, John. The talent is not the problem. He's got plenty of five stars. It's the coaching, and that's, that's why. See, that's he's that's where I'm going. With yeah, this. recruiting. I think he's great, but. He's not it's winning. Not what, it's what you've done Calipari with the talent, and it ain't a lot. No, that's that's why he's not third on that list because he's a good recruiter. I I would say that Burhalter is up there with the great recruiters right now, and Calipari cheats to get his recruiting half the time because he'll have a show. Yes, he'll have a show calls at Kentucky at some point. Don't worry, it'll happen. It's no just question. What he does. And then, wait, wait what he'll, he'll do is he'll leave just before it happens. Of course he will. All right, 
Uh, it's it's Calipari, it's Kirby, it's nah. Greg, and that's not a knock on Greg. The other two are just really, really good. It's just that Kirby can't seem to get everybody over the hump. Yeah, the coaching, I'll I'll take Berhalter over Kirby. I'll take yeah. any of them over Kirby because it's not working out. Um, Calipari's at the bottom for me because he's got to cheat to do it. Anyway, um, another bit of breaking news, and this is, uh, I don't know, it doesn't really get a sounder. It's just, it's very cool. World Soccer Talk is reporting this morning that ESPN will broadcast the April 3rd top-of-the-table clash between Bayern Munich and RB Leipzig live on ESPN2 and on ESPN Deportes along with ESPN+. Plus. April 3rd, top two in Germany will be on ESPN2. That's big, 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 big game. There's some big games coming up in the, the leagues around Europe. Well, and considering what the numbers were, was it 576,000 uh, viewers for Der Klassiker on Big ABC? Yeah. When you, when you see that, when you make that kind of investment from a, a TV and a production standpoint, you get that kind of a return. It makes continual sense to do these kinds of things on the, the big family of networks and not just keep it over on, on the plus the whole time. Yeah, they had, and, and we talked about this earlier in the season, we wondered why they weren't pushing more German games to TV. Like, Serie A games were going to ESPN News or ESPN2 or even ESPN at times. Um, the the Copa del Rey stuff was popping up on, on ESPN channels as well, but Bundesliga wasn't, and it was like, okay, you could do that too. There's some games here that would work, and you've got a, a lot of American players that would, I think, draw a number for you. That one finally, their classicer on ABC, I think, has turned their heads, and they're going to throw more games on your ESPNs, your ESPN twos, your ESPN news. Is hopefully more on ABC as well, but that's a huge game coming up April third. And hey, you know, once again, uh, props to the four letter for sitting there and seeing the results across the the ABC family of networks and continuing to want to do these kinds of things to see uh, what the response is going to be when it comes to viewership for these things. Yes. Um, Chris Ashley says, hopefully Burhalter didn't take a pointer from Jeremy Pruitt and pass off some cash in a McDonald's bag. <laughs> oh, no. But no, I don't no. think there's any rules against that. Like, that's the no. thing is this is not NCAA recruiting. This is FIFA. Like, yeah. how did FIFA drop a World Cup into Qatar? It wasn't McDonald's bags, but it was Straight envelopes cash of only. cash. It was envelopes of money, literally. Go read about the CONCACAF meetings where envelopes of money were handed out. You didn't have to go to the drive through You didn't have to go to the, the right McDonald's at the right time with the, the Connect hanging out, hanging out and handing out the cash. You just showed up at the meeting and you got an envelope full of money. Hi, thanks for coming by. I have an envelope. That was at a CONCACAF meeting. Yeah. This is what happens. So <laughs> if you're recruiting players to play for your national team, I think all bets are off. Uh-huh. That's what it takes. what it takes. Uh-huh. Um, exactly right. Jason Nix, Musa gets called into this upcoming Euro-US group, right? I would assume so. Uh, I would assume that was part of the announcement today. Um, Coco says, we lost an entire generation of young guys to Klinsman's regime. We need Greg to get as many of these guys as possible. Yeah, I mean, you want to get the guys that you want to get. Like, you're not going... You have to prioritize. And, yeah, if that means you lose an Efrain Alvarez and you put more attention into getting Yunus Musa and you get him, then that's, that's a better get. You have to think about that. I'm impressed, though, because we're talking about Klinsman for, like, three seconds. That's, that's too much. I didn't sign up for this today. Um, sometimes it happens, Jarrett. Sometimes it happens. Um, I know, but... A lot of people are, are, are yelling about Kirby Smart and Greg Pruitt and all kinds of things <laughs> going on in the, the Twitch pitch. Um Again, I want to make something clear, and people are, are like Mazzano says, what has Kirby gotten from all those top five recruiting classes? Like I said, nothing, because he's not doing the coaching part of the job well. Recruiting... Yeah. They should have a title, to be fair. They yeah. should, but they don't. Coaching. Recruiting and coaching are two different things, and it's the same thing for the national teams. Look, Greg Berhalter's doing a great job getting talent to say, I will play for the United States. I think everything you saw was a concerted effort from Musa's first appearance with the U.S., with players reaching out on Instagram, players commenting on his Instagrams, all those little things. That was all part of this. You get the deal done. That's great. You don't win a World Cup by winning a recruiting battle over a dual national. You win a World Cup through coaching. 
Through talent, yes, mm-hmm. but through coaching. So when you're ranking recruiters, and, and this is where I push back on you, John, about Kirby Smart. He's recruiting well. You can't say that he's not. No, he's it's top impossible. three in the nation when it comes to it, recruiting. That's the classes. whole point. So when you say he's a bad recruiter, you're wrong. He's a bad coach. That, yes. That's the difference. And I'm tired of the great recruiter and the bad coach as a Georgia fan. I don't want to see that for the U.S. I don't want to see this be the highlight of Greg Berhalter's regime. It's, it's a great video, a really cool thing. You get a player that had a lot of options, a lot of big options, who decided to pick the U.S. That's awesome. Now go win. Mm-hmm. Now go win a Gold Cup. Now go win the CONCACAF Nations League. Now go be the best team coming out of qualifying. And go into the World Cup and get into the knockout rounds and make some noise. That's what matters. This stuff is fun. It's nice. It's it's good to have fun ranking recruiting. End of the day, I could care less. Win. Do something with the talent that you recruited. And that's why, as a recruiter, Kirby's great. As a coach, how different is he than, than what you've had before? Really not anything different. Mm-hmm. Really yeah. nothing different at all. He's recruiting better, and his performances are about the same, so you might even say it's worse in some ways. You've got to be able to deliver on the coaching side. And, and yes, Joe Bost, I left Nick Saban out of that conversation entirely because he's taking care of all of the things and winning yes. all of the things. Uh, Tafka and Bartimus Prime on uh, Burhalter. Uh, Tafka says, let this be known, in all capital letters. Burhalter certainly had to do the work, but this win belongs to the players, too. This goes along with your point that you were just making, Jason. It seemed to use, uh, Musa was made to feel included from the get-go mm-hmm. by our young stars in an ultra-competitive circumstance. It's a big show of character. There was a camaraderie with Musa extremely quickly and genuinely given his limited call-ups and minutes. Here's Bart. Bart says, for me, this is almost Chip Kelly level of recruiting. Clearly, Burhalter is creating a system and program where people want to play, but not from scratch, improving the practices and perception. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's essential. Like, you've got to create an environment where people want to come be part of it, and that's a key. Um, Corb says, recruiting at an elite college basketball school cannot be compared to preparing a national team for a World Cup. That wasn't what we said, Corb. What we are talking about was the actual recruiting of the talent, because there is similarities between recruiting high school talented players and recruiting a teenager to elect to play for the United States. It's a skill set. And Greg Berhalter, which I didn't know that he would be good at this, um, because he never really had to do it in a significant way in, in his time in Columbus, he's been able to convince people, hey, This is the way I want to play. This is the environment I am going to create. We want you to be part of it. Do you want to be part of this? He was able to do that. He gets he gets credit for that. That is that's impressive to be able to sell the program that way. And there is similarities between recruiting in college and this. But no, preparing for a World Cup that gets to the second layer, like we're talking about the coaching side of it. Where it's Im- even more impressive is guys who can recruit and sell the program and bring in the talent and then win with the talent. That's the most important part because we don't remember these things. In 20 years, we're not going to remember the details of the Eunice Musa recruitment. We won't. Because we don't remember the details of the Roy Weggerly recruitment, which was a big one, a huge one for the United States in the early 90s. Uh, You were competing with South Africa, who was becoming an emerging team at that time. You were competing with England, although it was a wild outside chance that he would have played for England at that time, but they also didn't qualify for the 94 World Cups. Maybe it wasn't that wild. You were competing with big nations, and you won that one. You know, the the Tom Dooley's and and players like that. Okay, Dooley wasn't going to represent Germany at that time, but we don't remember those details anymore. We just know they elected to play for the U.S. It's going to be the same for Musa. What we remember is what those players did to help the United States, what the coach who recruited them did in winning games, winning tournaments, winning trophies. That's what we'll remember. But the more talent you have, the easier it should be to win, right? Right. Should be. And and that's not a there's there's no there's no hidden meaning here, John. Like 
if you are, we'll, we'll go back to the college thing for a second. If you have the talent level of Mississippi State, you're not going to win much in the SEC. No. Period. If you, are, if you go to Mississippi and you try to change who you're getting, and then you get the school in trouble because you had to do it illegally, you're not going to win much. You're going to pull some upsets. You're going to do all that. But what wins? The most talent. Now, once you get into the most talent category, get separated by coaching, right? You know, you have limitations. Like, if you are at Mississippi, you can have a great recruiting class for your school. You don't have the same talent as most of the teams in your conference. For the U.S., you know, like, for the longest, it was, you don't have more talent in Mexico. Well, now you can argue that you do. You can argue that talent level is comparable between the two. You can absolutely argue that. Now, you want to compare to the South American countries? We're having a different conversation. But Mexico, yeah, you can say the talent's level. So now you're getting into the coaching conversation. Because where there's a big talent gap, coaching can only do so much. You can pull an upset. You can have a little run. But you're always going to get one-upped by more talent. That's why what Leicester did to win the Premier League is such a crazy thing the year they did it. They didn't have the talent that the teams around them did. They were able to overcome that. You can't do it over a decade because talent wins out. So the recruiting of the talent is really important. And you've got to give Greg Berhalter a ton of props in that. Now the conversation will start to change. Can't complain about the talent level anymore. And that was one of the main complaints during Jurgen Klinsmann's time was, well, you know, how can you really expect him to do anything because the talent pool is so poor? No. That argument, wad it up, throw it in the trash, light it on fire. Now you've got to win at a level of your talent. Nobody's saying you have to win a World Cup. But the U.S. should not be missing World Cups. The U.S. should not be failing to make the finals of the Gold Cup. The U.S. should not be going into playoffs to qualify for the World Cup. The U.S. should be getting into the knockout rounds of the World Cup. That's where they should be, and that should be the bar. And that's the next job for Greg Berhalter is take the talent you recruited and go win with it. Don't be Kirby smart. (laughs) That's a little harsh, but sure, win with the talent you have. Right. It's not like they're bums, but yes, you need to win with the level of talent you have. You're not going to win a World Cup right now with the talent you have, but you should be winning CONCACAF. Mm-hmm. I think. I think it's fair to say that. I want to comp- You want to compare player for player with Mexico right now? You're pretty even. Pretty even. Now the question will be who's the better coach, Tata Martino or Greg Berhalter? We'll find out over time. It's a young group for the U.S., but it is very talented, and now you got to start winning with it. Yeah, and that's that's the bottom line for me. You're you're getting in all of this talent. You're attracting all of these guys to be a part of what you're trying to build. And now, pick your cliche. This is where the rubber meets the road. Whatever you're bringing in all these guys, now put it out there and get the wins and get to where you're supposed to be with the talent that you have on hand. Yeah, I mean, Four Card says the U.S. was very close to being a semifinalist in 2002, but that was an example to me of punching above your weight because talent-wise, that team wasn't more talented than Portugal. Um, It wasn't more talented. I don't think it was more talented than Mexico. It wasn't more talented than that German side. Uh, It's probably somewhat equivalent to the talent of Poland who, who beat you in the group stage, and you needed a miracle from South Korea to uh, get you into the knockout round. But that's how thin the margins can be. They punched above their weight in 2002. We saw it happen in 2006. You you couldn't sustain it. What you're trying to do now is build a program that can be sustained. And that's another big part of Burhalter's job, is recruiting this talent, bringing them in, setting the expectation for what the program's going to be. It's very important. Because then you can grow from there. Whoever comes in next will have a big job on their hands. And it should continue to kick on and kick up to where you have a competitive level of talent with some of the best teams in the world. Right now, you're still punching above your weight to, to play with the best teams in the world. But you shouldn't be doing that in CONCACAF. You, know, you should be battling it out with Mexico 
one A, one B. Everybody else is three, four, five, six, and further back. That's what it should be for the U.S. You shouldn't go to Toronto, for example, and get played off the park by Canada. Canada's good. Canada is, is good. They're better than they've been in a long time. You should not go up there and get played off the park in a Nations League match. Mm-mm, not with the talent you have. You should not have that happen anymore. Absolutely. Now, this is with, with everything that with everybody that you're bringing in now, what the expectation level should be, what it, you know, which what it should be is an entirely different level than what you've been accomplishing over the last handful of years and cycles. Now you should be right up there. Let's see you do it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's going to come down to now. Okay. You've got good talent. I think you can say, you can look at the Mexico talent and say, you're right there with them. This is where the coaching conversation is going to come up, and, and people are already talking about it on the Twitch pitch, and it will always be a talking point, especially in Atlanta. Tata Martino made it clear that he would like to be considered for that job. He made it clear that he would be interested. He was not talked to about the U.S. job at all. And there were conversations out there about it had to be an English speaker, et cetera, et cetera. Well, then Tata went to Mexico. And he's being paid handsomely to win with Mexico. And he's got a good team with Mexico, a very good team. But now, I don't think the U.S. should go into that game as a decided underdog. I think it's going to come down to the coaches. And we will see where Greg Berhalter stands. There's still questions. I think he's done a much better job. He has won me over a little bit with the recruiting. Yes, I'm I'm feeling good about Greg Berhalter these days. But Nations League, June... We could get an early referendum on this if both teams get past their semifinals that they should. Again, U.S. Honduras, different levels of talent. The U.S. should get through Honduras. There shouldn't be much of a hiccup there. It should be a U.S.-Mexico final for a trophy on the line. We'll get a little bit of a referendum on where this stands, in my opinion. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. And uh, Yunus Musa has, in the last 10 minutes, he's come out and posted a message to his Twitter account. But the title is, Let's Do It. I'm in. The future is us. So there you go. That's the, that's like, yeah, the yeah. rallying call. Yeah. yeah. That's where it stands. Um, Yunus Musa playing for the U.S. Uh, Jarrett, your thoughts on, on U.S., Mexico, CONCACAF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, where things stand right now after Greg Berhalter pulls off another recruiting master stroke, maybe? Heist? Eh, could be. He, he got he got a – well, was it wasn't even – was it even a flip? It's a win. It's it's a guy that you felt like you could get and you went and got him, which it, it is only a big deal when it doesn't happen. Uh, you know, we see this all the time in recruiting. Of, that guy's going to go there. Oh, he didn't. That's a problem. It's like, oh, that's a guy you can get. Go get him then. Cool. Did your job. I don't mm-hmm. mean that in a way to criticize Greg because they did their job. And again, simple things are always simple until they're not being done. Um as far as all the coffee cap goes, like I think it's just it, it's all different animals, um, and this is the same way in every. I think it's the same way in every area of the globe, but uh, combat ball and coffee calf are just like everywhere else, except more so. It's just a it's it's a weird it's a weird place with weird countries that that aren't necessarily better than you. But you really got to be careful when you play them because they can just jump up and, you know, cause you all sorts of problems. You go to Costa Rica, you can have problems. You can go to Honduras and have problems on any given day. And it's just, uh, does it does it come down to something like, and I, I use the term because I can't think of anything else, like a level of professionalism that, hey, we're going to go into a tough environment. We're going to have to play well. We're going to have to do this, that, and the other against, say, you know, Canada doesn't have that same reputation. Props to Canada for what they have done in the last year plus. But it, 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 CONCACAF is such a weird animal. But at the same time, yeah, you should feel like, hey, this is this is a this is a group of countries that we should feel we are 1A or 1B in all the time. And I hope Greg is that guy to get you there. And then I think what, no matter what happens with him, I think the next thing is you need to get the next hire right too. You cannot have a regressive move after him because I think it becomes a thing of, hey, if he gets you going in the right direction, that's awesome. Uh, national team coaches shouldn't linger longer than necessary at jobs. 
uh, see Germany. And I think you want to make sure that this is the start of something bigger than just Greg Berhalter. Yeah, you shouldn't be in that situation again, in my opinion, on the coaching side, because, you know, we've had this conversation with Germany. Like, you have American coaches now to consider that maybe you didn't when when Klinsman got the job. Maybe at that time, and I think it's a very different era for United States soccer 10 years ago when Jurgen Klinsmann got the call and Bob Bradley was pushed out after a Gold Cup final loss. One of the great Gold Cup finals, by the way, in 2011. Uh, Giovanni Dos Santos has lived off of that final for a long time. Um, maybe, maybe for you. I was the only one. In, I, I watched that with a bunch of friends, and I was the only one who was not from Mexico in the house. No, no, no. It was a great final because it was a great game. I didn't say the result was great from an emotional standpoint. I'm just saying it was a great match because the U.S. jumps out to a big accurate. lead. Mexico comes back. It was back and forth. Bradley gets fired. Klinsman comes in. You know, at that time, American coaches, you were talking about Dominic Kinnear, you know, 2011, like, that was about it. You weren't talking about Bruce Arena at that point because he had just left after the 2006 World Cup. You were talking about Kinnear in Houston. That's that's probably all at that time. You know, maybe there were some whispers about Jason Christ, who had won MLS Cup a couple of years before. Maybe. You didn't have any options. Now... Let's let's say it's it's after twenty two and Burhalter gets a job to go to Europe to some big club. Let, let's let's play the fantasy game and he's gone. He leaves. He gets a job that he can't say no to. You're looking at Jesse Marsh. You're looking at Jim Curtin. You're looking at maybe Peter Vermees. You're looking at at a lot of different guys who are in this country who are Americans who understand the program. Doesn't mean you have to hire an American. But you're going to be able to pick somebody who I think has a better understanding of the player. I don't think it's an accident that Greg Berhalter is doing a good job building the culture around this U.S. program as opposed to what Klinsman did during the second half of his run after the World Cup in 14, where it felt like the culture deteriorated. So that's where it stands. Um (laughs) <laughs> Wildchar is asking for thoughts on the preseason scrimmage for Atlanta. Be really careful about going deep into thoughts on a two and a half minute video package uh, that is very tightly produced to not show you very much. <laughs> um, it's a three 0 win. I mean, from what we heard, uh, it was like a first preseason friendly for a good bit of it. Um, the pressure from Atlanta over time forced giveaways. You took advantage. You punished them. That's what you're going to do. And Atlanta, the better team, wins 3-0. Both teams are working on things. The result really doesn't matter. I don't think there's really not much to get out of it. Um, and the highlights, they're not. They're designed to not give you anything to take out A lot of, of, t- a lot of tight shots. Yeah, a lot, the, of, stuff a lot of tight shots by design. This, this was produced to not give you anything so uh-huh. don't it's jump produced to, to say something happened but you can't see what it was don't jump to too many conclusions um a lot of well, we'll take your questions that's probably how we're going to finish most of the show so if you got questions on the twitch pitch go ahead and fire them off uh corb says mexico better coach u.s better players between the two i would agree with that i mean you look at the mexican roster you don't have guys at at chelsea and at barcelona and at rb leipzig you know, you've got guys at some of the biggest clubs in the, the world right now that represent the United States. That is a big, big, big deal. That shows you the talent level. Um, Burhalter's got to show that he can win these games now, these games that matter. That CONCACAF Nations League final, I know Nations League, we, we don't really care a bunch. I'm pumped about that game because that's going to be the game that should be full strength, all go, best team you can field in that match against Mexico. And we'll see where it stands before you go into qualifying in the fall. That's huge. That is a huge opportunity. Um, Shooter McGavin hanging out. It's been a while, Shooter. Welcome back. Hope you're doing well. Um, Jimenez, Raul Jimenez, yes, he is maybe in a better place than other U.S. strikers before he got hurt. 
And now we don't know what we'll see from Raul Jimenez, if we see him again anytime soon. I mean, is he training with Wolves now? Yeah, uh, Nuno Espirito Santo is hoping to have him back by the end of the season. Don't know in how many minute capacities or anything like that, but he is training, but to the level and to the strength of it, we don't know. But Nuno's optimistic by having him back by the end of the year. And Cor, Zardis could lace the boots of Jimenez, but Jimenez is a better player. Uh, Daryl DK might end up being that guy. Um, he's coming on fast, and, and we'll see what happens with DK. He could end up being that guy. I still think Sebastian Soto could be a great fit, but he's got to start playing games, meaningful games. Um, Sargent has done better this season. I don't know if he's done enough to be the guy. Yeah. That's the, the position that hasn't got settled. And, and look, if you're you know any team in the world, you're going to win games with a goal scorer. And I don't know exactly who that is for the U.S. right now. You've also, if you're Greg Berhalter, now that you got Musa, one second, Jarrett, Christian Pulisic, you got to make sure he's playing. Because if he's not, that hurts you. It does. You've got to make sure he's playing, or you're going to have to consider having him come off the bench. He didn't look great this weekend when he got his first start in a while. Christian Pulisic's future is going to be a big talking point for the U.S. program in the summer. Go ahead, Jared. I think for me, also looking at it is looking at the way that looking at the way that we approach and how we talk about strikers, um, and that we don't move the dang gum goalposts on them constantly, like we've done with a guy like Josie for years. Is be realistic and don't don't. Don't crush these guys under burden. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's happening with the U.S. right now, though, Jared. Not now. I, I think it's reasonable to expect a Sergio Dest to play at a Barcelona level. It's reasonable to expect Christian Pulisic to play like the guy that Chelsea shelled out a ton of money for. It's reasonable for those things. Um, Josie was maybe when he first went to Europe, it was a newer at that time. Maybe the expectations were too much for him. He was also in some bad situations as well. Um, I think now it's a little more reasonable, but you know, now expecting Adams to perform like a top guy in the Bundesliga, he's at a top club, Pulisic, Dest, et cetera, et cetera. That's okay. They should be, they should expect to, they, they should be expected to perform at that level. But no, and it's, I, I look at Zardes, and I know that a lot of folks have an incredibly negative thought pattern when it comes to him. But I want to continue to see him up top. I want to continue to see him integrate. And I want to continue to see him succeed on a national stage the way that we have in, in MLS. I want to continue to see those things for him. I'm I'm one of those guys that wants to see Jossie Zardes get that chance and continue to get that chance. Obviously, if you're not producing, then don't. But what I'm saying is from what we've seen from what he is in Major League Soccer, I'm hoping it translates more to national, uh, to national uh, action than it has in the past. I disagree. I don't want to see that because there are players with a higher ceiling. And if Jossie Zardes is the guy for the U.S., it means that other players haven't panned out like we expected. And that would be quite a few. I mean, that would yeah. be DK. That would be Wea potentially. That would be Sargent. That would be Soto. I mean, that's a lot of guys who I think have a higher ceiling than Jossie Zardes. If it is Jossie Zardes, it means, one, he's playing well. And right. It could mean that other guys are not. No, I, I, and it's not saying I don't want him to fail. It's, it's saying I want there to be more talent. But he is a good player, and he has scored goals at the club level. And I have no problem with seeing him today. In a year or two, Sargent should be taking that jump. Yeah. Soto should be taking that jump. DK mm -hmm. should be taking that jump. We've been waiting for Wea to take that jump. I think he needs to play as a number nine. That's four guys that should pass Jossie Zardes. So no, I don't want to see Jossie's artist. It's, I'm not. I'm not saying he should be the guy. That would mean somebody else has failed, and I think there are better players coming, but they're not yeah. there yet. And then yeah. you have Josie Altador, 
who is is not past it yet. He's banged up constantly. Uh, you also have Io Akinola, who is going into the last year of his contract, it seems like, in Toronto. Could he emerge into that? But Josie, Josie will, if he is in good form, get an opportunity. And he yep. should. But Josie and Zardis should get passed by this young generation, but somebody has to actually do it. Right. Is it Sargent? Is it DK? Is it Weya? Is it Soto? One of them have to take the job and not give it back. That's the thing here. If it is back to Josie, or if it is Zardis, who are fine, that means four other guys that had a higher ceiling failed, and that's not where we want to be. Tafka has a list of 21 guys that are currently incredibly young right now in the national team picture. He says, not all will hit, but for, for lifelong national team fans, we don't know what to do with ourselves. They're all 25 or younger. In recent decades, we'd be lucky to have one or two players good enough for the national team at that age, and most didn't make it to that level until they were 25 to 27. It's really hard to fathom. And that's just at midfield. The guys he listed were all midfield. Yeah, I mean, uh, and Matthew Hopp, thank you, Walchara, thank you. Um, I knew there was one more I was trying to come to. He's more of a wild card because he was not anywhere on the horizon until very recently. But yeah, you've got to see what happens with him. He might have a big move this year. So let's see what happens. That's five guys now. Um, a little overstated from, from Tafka, which I, I, I understand. I know where it's coming from. Um, you've had talent in the pool before. You're going to have ups and downs. Every country does. You're going to have a generation that doesn't come good. Um, I think the late 2000s, even with the 2006 debacle, which I put more on Bruce Arena and getting defensive and a tough draw. I mean, you got the in the 2006 World Cup, and this is where the draw can make things look a lot worse than they are. You got the champions in your group, and you're the only team that got anything off of the champions in 2006, Italy. You had the Czech Republic, who I think was ranked third in the world going into that tournament, um, and they beat you up. And you had Ghana, who was very good. That was your group. That was a group of death. That was absolutely a group of death. But that generation, the 2002 to 2010 group, very, very talented. I think you had a lot of talent coming through at the same time. There was a lull after that. Some of it's down to not qualifying for Olympics and getting those games for people, but it's not all that. That's like a... It's, it's a little bit of a fallacy to say, oh, it's just because you didn't qualify for the Olympics. That's why you had a, a decrease in quality. No, I mean, three games or four games or five games, if you make a run, doesn't decide somebody's development. But it would have helped. You just had a bit of a downturn. It happens. I mean, Spain has went through it. England has went through it. Italy has went through it. Germany goes through it. Everybody goes through it. Right now, you're on an upswing. Some of the difference with the U.S. in that upswing is the fact that you have better development of talent in this country than you've ever had before. You're also getting some of these dual nationals because of the recruiting aspect of it. So you have more talent than I think you've ever had. It's deeper. But you've also started here very recently. Because I think the 2018 pool qualifying for that World Cup was deeper than it had been before. But you didn't have the top, top guys that you had in the past. You didn't have the stars that you had in that 0-2 to 10 run. You didn't have a Clint Dempsey, for example. You didn't have a Landon Donovan, for example. Two transformational talents for the U.S. You didn't have anybody like that in trying to qualify for 2018. You had depth. You had a wide pool. But the top guys weren't like they are now. Now... You've got a Dest at Barcelona. You've got a Pulisic who is better than he was as a, as a kid trying to qualify in 18, 17. You've got Adams at RB Leipzig. You've got guys coming through. Your top guys are better than they've ever been. That's where I think it has changed is you've got that combination of both. You've got the depth. You've got a lot of options coming through. I mean, you can look at left back. 
and project 2026. I, I saw Matt Doyle projected Sam Vines to be the starter by the time you get to 26. George Bellow would have a conversation about that. A lot of players would. There's a lot of young, talented players at that position. You can go all the way across the board. There's going to be more options than ever, but the top guys are becoming top guys. That's the difference. You don't win just with depth. You've got to have stars. And when now your stars are not playing at, I'm trying to remember where, where guys were going into 2010. I mean, Dempsey was at Fulham. Uh, Bradley, oh, I don't know if he had moved to Italy at that point or not. I don't think he had. Um I want to say Josie was in the Netherlands. Don't worry about it, John. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Don't waste your time. Don't do that. Um, it doesn't matter. Those clubs were not Barcelona and Chelsea and RB Leipzig, who is battling it out for a Bundesliga title. That's a difference. It's a huge difference. So it feels like this program's in a better place than it's ever been. Now you get to coaching. Now you get to can you win the games that matter. Because all the other stuff is great. If you have bad performances and you have bad coaching, it doesn't really matter, does it? Mm-hmm. So back in, you know, so say a decade ago, you had a lot of guys who were probably what? Sevens and eights on a scale of one to ten. And now you've got guys. No, no, who no, are no, 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 no. A decade ago, you had guys that were eights. Clint Dempsey, as good as Christian Pulisic is, he's not done what Clint Dempsey did. He's not, he hasn't done what Landon Donovan's done. Mm hmm. Could he? Absolutely. Absolutely he could. They haven't yet. So no, I'm not going to sit here and, and knock Landon Donovan and Clint Dempsey, two of the best players you've ever had. I'm not going to go back and knock Eddie Pope, maybe the best center back that you've ever had. I'm not going to go back and, and knock Carlos Bocanegra, one of the best center backs you've ever had. Mm-mm. Were they at the same, were they playing at those levels at that time, at a Barcelona, at a Chelsea? No, they weren't. There was also perception they were battling. Those clubs weren't looking at American players at that time either. But no, 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 that's not it. A decade ago, 2002 to 2011, we'll we'll, we'll close the door at the the Gold Cup final that Bradley lost to Mexico. You had a great generation of talent for the United States. This generation, right now, and it's still early days, can blow that one out of the water because they're getting into the bigger clubs now that they weren't at that time. The last decade is where you didn't have a Landon Donovan, a Clint Dempsey at the peak of their powers. You didn't have those top, top level guys. You had good depth, but you didn't have somebody to put the team on their back and win games. I still want to know who that is now, because you've got good players. Can... Can Tyler Adams boss a game from the midfield? Can Serginho Dest shut down a top winger in the world? Can Christian Pulisic put the U.S. on his back and win games? Can they do that? Can Daryl DK or Josh Sargent have the game that Josie did against Spain in 2009? Can they do it? Can one of these guys give you the moment that Landon Donovan did where he blocks out all the madness and scores the greatest goal in U.S. men's national team history to send you to the next round of the World Cup? Can they do that? we got to find out. we got to find out because other guys have. And that's your measuring stick. Who do you think from just what you've seen so far might be the closest to doing that? Well, they're all different. I mean, you know, you're not asking Dest to do that because he's a defender. Um, I'll tell you the one who has the personality, and, and thank you, Wilt, somebody that I haven't mentioned yet. I, I was trying to come up with the best addition to this, and I think he could end up being maybe one of the more successful ones. I don't know exactly how he fits into it because of his role, but Weston McKinney, from a personality standpoint, could be the captain of this team for a long time. Um He's got that mentality. Can he boss a game centrally? It's, it's, it's different. Maybe he's in a better position to do that than Tyler Adams. He's not going to go score a ton of goals, but could he score big goals? He feels like he's got the personality that can grab that moment. He can. 
Um, maybe it's him. Maybe it's him. Maybe it is Daryl DK who is emerging really fast. You know, Pulisic with his incredible talent. I mean, he could be a Landon Donovan kind of player. Can he stay healthy? You know, I mean, there, there's there's a lot of questions. Zach Steffen, can he be what Brad Friedel was in 2002? You know, can he be what Tim Howard was? Can he be that level? He's had a club that could put him at that level. He's got to continue to develop. It's it's exciting. It is. It's really exciting. But it's not a finished product by any stretch. And it, it never is because the minute that you think, okay, this is my group, this is the group that's going to go to 2022, you've got an injury and you've got to go turn to somebody else and, and it changes. But Weston McKinney seems to have that personality to handle these things. You've got players that seem to have the talent. But now the pressure's at a different level. Now you got to go and win the CONCACAF Nations League. Now you got to go and, and, and dominate in the octagonal. You've got to go and, and dominate those things. And, and you've got to go and, and nobody's expecting to win the 2022 World Cup. That, that's insanity. You're not at that level yet. I mean, you're not going to be a favorite in 26 outside of having the games in your country. That's going to help you. But you should be getting out of the group stage consistently. Yeah. You should be qualifying in style and without heartburn, and you should be getting out of the group stage. And then it's down to the draw. It's down to where things fall. That should be your goal. That should be your goal every time now. You know. I mean, it goes back Is to it the... fair to say you should be in the same conversation as a Belgium of you need to be getting out of the group stage, taking a scalp or two sometimes, and then if you hit the right generation, you should be a dark horse as it stands with the goal of in the next 15 years or so being a uh, being more than a dark horse. That's absolutely fair. Um, you know, I mean, you could put it in with the Netherlands as well. I mean, the Netherlands have maybe been the best of that group. They've been to two World Cup finals. And we're, we're taking big stretches of history here, too. You know, the Dutch have been to you know, three World Cup finals and lost. When they've had the right generation, they've been able to play with anybody in the world. Can you get into that conversation? Uh, Belgium's been to two semifinals, I think. Um, you can be in that world. You know, look, you're not going to be in the world even with, with England, who has one title. You're not going to be in the world with the Argentinas, the Brazils, the Italys, Spain with world one title. I mean, Spain, honestly, is a, a pretty good spot to compare yourself to as well because they weren't getting into these conversations. They were that team that was good, not great for a long, long time until you put it together on a lot of different fronts. And you had the generation that won the Euros back-to-back in 08 and 12, won the World Cup in 10, one of the greatest generations we've ever seen at the national team level. And what have they been since? Yeah, okay, good, good. You know, maybe that's the one to shoot for, where you get past what the Dutch have done, you get past what the Belgians have done, and you actually win a World Cup. It's a well, long way down the road. But you are hosting one in 26. And it's like you don't want to ignore 22, but you do have to think about 26, where you're going to have the home field. You're going to have the, the, the crowd advantage. You're going to have all those things. It's wild to think about it, but yeah, you could be in the mix. Um, Will said that Alexi Lawless has said that the U.S. should at least win a knockout game at every World Cup. That should be your plan going into everyone. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that as an expectation. Of course, the draw is going to change it. You get put into the group of death, and yeah, anything can happen. I mean, we all know this, but in a vacuum, yeah, that should be your expectation. You should be among the 8 to 16 best teams in the world. No question about that. Musa caught up with, uh, or sorry, Jeff Carlisle caught up with Musa. And just some quick quotes out of it. It started apparently with a text back on March the 4th where he just texted Burhalter and said, Coach, can I talk to you? And that was when he said that he was going to be uh, playing internationally for the U.S. 
Musa said it was quite a happy conversation. I told him I appreciate everything and how he welcomed me to the team, and I just want to embark on this journey with everyone else and the USA. And then apparently Burhalter screamed into the phone. And and look, that's that's a credit to Greg Burhalter and his coaching staff. It's also a credit to the vibe that he's created among this group of young players. Who the fact that you've got a lot of young guys who are breaking into big clubs in the world all at the same time, they do seem close knit. It's, it's so big because you bring a guy like Musa in and he fits right in and they make him fit in. It's a big, big deal. Um, Cap says McKinney is probably the most talented player that we have playing for us. He's really grown a lot. I don't know. Um, and you're comparing positions where the, the talents are, are different, the, the characteristics are different. Christian Pulisic, it feels like it comes easy for him because of just his you know God-given gifts as an athlete. Uh, I can't say healthy, which is the hard thing about it, but he, incredibly talented. McKinney takes incredible talent, but I think he combines it with a mentality that we don't have enough of. And sometimes McKinney runs too hot. And, and yeah, sometimes he picks up cards and he commits fouls that he shouldn't. I'd rather have that and dial it down than have to get somebody to give me that and try to talk them into that. It's the mentality for, Min- for McKinney that wins me over every time. It's the mentality is the biggest deal. And that's contagious. Talent can't be contagious. You, you, you are or you aren't. You know, yeah. I mean, if you, you see it in any sport, you have guys who are not as talented as the people around them, but they outwork them or they have the, the mentality to handle adversity better or what have you, whatever it is. McKinney's got great talent, but it's that mentality. That's what I love about it. And, and that's where I think put the armband on him and, and let him lead this team officially. I'm, I'm all for it. And when you see someone like that, you don't want to let that individual down who's wearing the armband. You want to work like that person so you can all accomplish the same things. I completely see something like that, yes. Who excites you the most in this group right now, Jarrett? Nobody. Jarrett's not excited about anything. Um, No, I'm thinking. Um you were thinking about Celtic for a minute, and you got unexcited. <laughs> no, honestly, like I was, it, it might be a guy because because you mentioned him late because the, the Twitch pitch mentioned him, but it might be a guy like a McKinney, just not necessarily as a guy who's going to score goals, but a guy who can who can be the energy because that's something I'm always nervous about with Concacaf is like going into you know going into a game in Central America where it's going to be hostile, it's going to be weird. And I want someone who I'm excited about having somebody who can carry the energy and make sure that you don't have that let down. And I think you can be that guy. And it's a different kind of leader than you had, I think, with Michael Bradley, not to take anything away from what Michael Bradley was as captain. But I think it's a I think it's a different kind of, you know, like high energy kind of guy potentially, but it's it's always nice to have those to have a guy who can kind of help pace the pace the energy that way because without it you can have a lot of talent but if everybody comes in with the wrong energy and the wrong the wrong mindset it can get sideways. Yeah, I I, I don't think there was a problem with Bradley's energy. Um, I don't. I, oh no, I, I'm not trying to take away from. Yeah. I'm not trying to take away from his energy at all. I don't mean it as a shot against him. Yeah, I I, I don't think it was it was that. Um, I think McKinney's different. And I think, too, you've also got a group, and Johannes pointed it out on the Twitch pitch, and I totally agree. You've got a group that is all close-knit, around the same age. You know, it's it's a generational thing. You know, I think you need one of them to lead this group. You know, it can't be on the veteran. It can't be, like, on a Josie. You know, Josie's got to come in and fit into the group. The group is the, the... Guys who are, you know, 24 and younger. Right. Those are the ones who are going to determine this. Those are the ones that are going to, you know, establish what this team is. The, the older players you get called in, and you're going to need them from time to time. Look, this, this World Cup qualifying campaign, it's going to be a, a marathon. 
And you're going to have a situation where Christian Pulisic's hurt. You're going to have a situation where McKenney's on yellow card suspension. I mean, it, it'll happen. These things will happen. And you're going to have to turn to, if it's a Sebastian Legette, if it's a Jossie Zardes, you know, whoever it is, you're going to have to turn to somebody who is an older player who's got to come in and fit into the group and give you a performance. It's where that big depth is important. You're going to need that. Can I give you another guy who, uh, yeah. who I'm very curious about to be that depth guy? Yeah. Is Chris Mueller. I'm not as high on that. I'm not. I think, I think there's, he can there's be so a, many I think better he can options. Be a, I, I get that. I think he can be a guy that you're not looking to start, but, hey, we got some injuries, and we have to throw him on there, and I just need 60 good minutes from him. I think he can be that guy who you slot in because you need somebody to come in and just to just kind of uh, Nathaniel Knight it to crossover sports. Yeah. I uh, need it every night. I just need it for a little bit today. The the thing is, um, he's got to play at Orlando, and that's not a guarantee either. With what Orlando's added this season and, and the talent they have, he's got to lock down a starting spot there. He might not. He might not have that this that's year. Gonna be, I would love to see what the market looks like in MLS for him in terms of a trade. Because I think a lot of teams would be willing to make the, make the kind of move you saw made for Gressel up. We can bring this. We can spend mm-hmm. money and bring this guy in and try and make it. Yeah, fit. they could. I, I I think he's very good. I I don't think he is at that. You make level. a fair point about Orlando though about like the playing time. But yeah, I think that's going to be a thing for them. I mean, Alvarado, who they brought in late last season, will be pushing for time. You've got Nani. You've got to squeeze Benji. Michelle is a really talented player as well. You've got a lot of different options. Um, question on the or conversation on the switch pitch is about center back and what that pairing looks like and who it is right now. And I don't know. I mean, Brooks, I think, is, is one of the two. I don't know who the other one is at the moment. You know, could it be Richards? Sure, it could. Could it be Miles Robinson? Yep, it could. Could it be Aaron Long? Yeah, possibly. Uh, I think Walker Zimmerman deserves a look after the year he had. I think he deserves an opportunity to play next to Brooks and see if he can win that job. It's up for grabs. You know, it, it could look very different by the time we get to 22. Richards might be established. Richards might be playing a lot more at that point. Right now, it's still a bit of a question. Um, that's maybe one of the biggest question marks, is who is your two starting center backs first for that Nations League semifinal and final? You know, Brooks and who? If Assuming you're at complete full strength, who is it? I, I don't really know the answer to that right now. I don't. Uh, Tim Ream's going to push into that right now. I don't know if he's going to be there by the time you get to 22, but he's going to push into that right now. You've got a lot of guys who can push for that spot, and Miles Robinson's one of them. He can be at that level. That's maybe the biggest question mark. Um, outside of the young guys, you know, and, and who emerges and who's playing well and the ups and downs of being a young player, all that. Right now, I don't know who the starting center backs are uh, when you get to June. Not even getting to September for World Cup qualifiers, just to June. Just the June yeah. for Nations League. I don't know who it is. I'm inclined to, like, if I have to lay money on it, I'm inclined to think it's like Aaron Long and John Brooks, assuming everyone's healthy. But that's... Maybe. That's also an assumption. Then I think that's, that's where I would put my money down, but I wouldn't put it down confidently. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, Jason Nix, we have talked about Luciano Acosta to Cincinnati uh, over time. Um, it makes Cincinnati interesting. Uh, you've got another potential trade when it comes to MLS that Stephen Goff is talking about this morning, hearing that New York City is trading with the Red Bulls for the MLS rights to PSV defender Chris Gloucester. I wonder if that means Gloucester is coming back. Um, they did just sign a outside back. New York City did. So I don't know what's going on with their recruiting at all right now. Maybe they need to hire Greg Berhalter to lead their recruiting efforts. It's kind of strange. Um, a lot of teams were active in preseason this weekend. There really wasn't a lot to dig into. You know, it's a lot of highlights. Cincinnati lost to Louisville in preseason. I know a lot of people had a lot to say about that. Um, George Davis, the fourth, who is a team administrator with Louisville, is also, I believe, the all-time appearance leader in USL Championship. Um, he scored. Uh, Bart, I wish I could talk about it. They lost a game that nobody saw. I mean, Cincinnati <laughs> so lost to Louisville 3-0. Well, yes, it happened, but we don't know why it happened. 
Was Cincinnati working on things? Did they make mistakes to give up the goals? Did they get outplayed? We don't know. It's the same stuff we don't know about the, the Atlanta United Tormenta game. We, we don't know. And teams want it that way. Coaching staffs want it that way. Jake as they, as they should. Yeah, as they should. They, they, right now, they don't want this stuff out there. Um, because, I mean, we're creating narratives about games we're not even seeing. So, you know, you don't want a narrative. Um, <laughs> Coco says the Cincinnati bring their U15 team to play. <laughs> I, I don't think that part is accurate, but I, I, nobody I, I knows. I laughed out loud with that. Nobody knows. Yes, you, you laughed. It's okay. Um, nobody knows. So Still better than uh, watching Bobby Shuttlesworth not be able to stop. Oh. Well, now, okay, here's something you can take out of that. Sure, they made a mistake. They gave up a goal. Oh, MLS. <laughs> Let's, let's crack off the great tweets and look at MLS. Her, 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 her. Chicago won that game, by the way. And I yes, did get did. to watch but some of that. I, no, 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 no. They outplayed New York City in that game by a large margin. Because um, I did get to watch some of that one. Um, yeah, it's not about it's not about whether or not they outplayed them. It's because it's for me. This is this is a matter for me personally that Bobby Shuttlesworth is one of my favorite enigmas in this league because mm-hmm. he can just turn into a stone wall for ninety minutes, and then he can make just the mistake where you're like, how? And it's, it's Bobby Shuttlesworth is always entertaining for sometimes the right reasons, but, but sometimes but, the wrong Jared, reasons. it's like thirty it, forty. It, it's thirty forty seconds into preseason, and it's a miscommunication between Shuttlesworth and Calvo, and and Shuttlesworth yeah, but it botches it. He it. feeds into my Don't pass it backward to Bobby Shuttlesworth ever again. No, no, no you can no, do no, that. No, it was just no. one little error, but it was just like ah, that's that's one where you're kind of like, it, for me, it, it, it's kind of like the. It's kind of like the, the, the one in preseason from 2017 where Can like, kicks it off like off of somebody and it rolls back into his net. Um, where it's like that, you're going to get narratives left and right about it, but it's not, it doesn't define a guy by any stretch of the imagination. It's just like, oh, this is preseason. Preseason's where all the fun, weird stuff happens. Yeah. I'm going to laugh at it, but I'm not going to build an entire narrative over a guy about it. Look, preseason has layers to it. Like, it's one thing to create narratives about two or three minute highlight reels that don't really show you anything. That's one. It, it, it's another to create narratives about games you can watch in, in totality in preseason because they're not being played like regular season games. You know, you're not playing them to win. You're playing them to improve for the regular season. So you, you can get stuck in and be wrong in creating narratives about a game you can even watch the whole thing of. Over a whole preseason where you can watch a good bit of it, yeah, you can start to look like this guy's playing well. This guy's not playing well. This guy doesn't look like he's comfortable. This guy isn't a, isn't playing well with the guys around. You can start to look at those things. That's what coaching staffs will do. We're not seeing all of it. So you just have to be careful with, with finding those things in it. Um, last call for questions on Twitter at Soccer Down Here and on the Twitch pitch. It's been a show all over the map today, which is always fun. we got soccer over there coming up at 7 o'clock, uh, where I'm sure we'll talk recruiting. We'll, we'll talk about the leagues around the world. We'll kind of set the scene for Champions League this week as well, um, where the, the races are in each of the leagues in Europe, too. Johannes asks, should we be worried about England's recruiting skills, having lost Musa and Musiala in the last two weeks? Yeah, you should. Yeah. England, uh, you know, Gareth Southgate has has got a World Cup semifinal under his belt, but the recruiting aspect, Greg Berhalter's doing a little bit better job. Mm -hmm. Um, You want both, and ultimately, if I have to pick one, I want the wins, always. But yeah, you gotta gotta ask the question, why? Especially with Musa. Musiala, if I'm not mistaken, actually with both, I think. I, I think both had fairly decent ties to England. You know, it's not like a stretch. I mean, I think Musa might have had stronger ties to to England than he did to the United States. So what happened? What was it? This, I'm sure, will be a narrative on talk sport and all the different uh, talking head shows. In England, I'll be curious to see what they have to say about it, or do they even 
really care in the same way because like we said you know i mean like like john when you said you were looking for musa on england's roster he's not going to be there because they're not going to put him on their roster right now look at the talent they have he's not beating out some of the guys ahead of him he'll play for the u.s right now yeah he's still got to play well to earn that spot but he'll he'll jump straight into the u.s team he won't in england so are they even paying attention are they even talking about something like this right we'll have to wait and see uh bart talking about cincinnati and louisville Cincinnati fans claim they were playing Academy Reserve players, but I still claim that <laughs> losing 3 to nothing to a USL team is bad. No, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how they lost. I don't know why they lost. Did, uh, they, did they lose on three passes that were deflected and given away and, and Louisville punished them on? Did they get thoroughly outplayed? Like I, We don't know. So, no, I, I, I will not yell with you, Bart. I, I will not yell with you on this one. I don't have enough information. If they follow this up with a, another bad loss, then we start to say, well, wait a minute here. What's going on? Are, what, are they trying to work on something that's just really not working, or what's going on here? But one game, I'm not, I'm not doing it yet. Everybody's down on Cincinnati. This is continuing the narrative. Ricky Ricardo, <laughs> Cincinnati's got a beautiful stadium to get blown out in this year. <laughs> Cincinnati's not going to get blown out this year, I don't think. Not when they get everybody. They don't have Luciano Acosta at the moment. Um, they're going to be they're going to be better. I, I don't think they're the worst team in the East. I think DC is, and I think Montreal could be in that conversation. I can't wait to see Cincinnati Stadium, um, and I do hope it's a blowout in that game. But I don't think they're going to get blown out on a regular basis. Um, Jason Nick says, "Oh, and the youth team's drubbing of Orlando, four wins out of four. Very cool. Yes." Always good to see the Academy results. I know Charlotte is coming to town here soon. Um, we're working on pulling together streams of that, so stay tuned. Hopefully we'll be able to get those and uh, get to see the, the U-17s, the U-19s, to get to see how they compete with uh, Charlotte here in the rematch of the games that we've seen earlier this season. Um do 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 do. Oh, Coco. Uh, oh, we overreacting to preseason matches. We saw none of. So we are assuming Mulraney and Wolf are tying for the Golden Boot, right? Yep, we are. Yes, and, and Kubo Torres. Yes. Yes, one hundred percent. Absolutely. Um, it, it was the Jake Mulraney revenge game, obviously. Obviously, uh, and that's going to dictate the entire season. Uh, obviously, it's going to dictate everything. Um, Hearts stand up, y'all. MVP <laughs> candidate Jake Mulraney. Yes, this is true. Uh, Joseph will be the assist king. Yes, he will decide not to score goals this season. He'll be season. Kevin De Bruyne this year in MLS. Yes, uh, sure, absolutely, absolutely. Mulraney's coming for Vela's record, one hundred percent. Yes, all these things. Um, <laughs> Modaflo is is now telling us Joseph's going to go after that record, and then he'll try something else in week two. Sure. Knowing, I, the man missed a year. He's got a year of pent up anger and Ooh. goal scoring that <laughs> that is somehow going to have to be like vented, like built up. Like like built up gas in a coal mine. I don't know how you get it all out safely. Man's gonna try and drop like ten goals a game. Mm, I hope not, because I hope he's gonna have to fit into the system here and and do what uh, Gabriel Heinze is is asking that number nine to do, which isn't just stand up there and wait for service. He's gonna have a lot to do, and I mm-hmm. think you know Joseph made it clear in his media availability last week, and when we've had a chance to talk to guys and hear from guys. They are being worked very hard, and uh, the the line that Joseph said that has stuck with me is, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it, but um, I think he basically said, look, I don't know if we're going to win, but we're going to fight, and we're going to run. Um, that's the mentality here, and obviously, yes, they want to win, but you can't control that part. You can't control how much you run, and you can't control how much you fight, and this will be a very combative team that with the quality they have on the ball should be able to then flip that switch. You are combative without it, and then you show your quality with it. And that's the, the dichotomy of this team, I think, when we get forward. Um, maybe Cincinnati had too much skyline chili, as DM Tim proposes for that. Way, way you down, I could see that. Yeah. Maybe they, they weren't able to get the pregame meal situated, and they had some skyline chili, and then you, you, you lose 3-0 to Louisville. Maybe that happened. Um, I think Louisville is now saying they will win the U.S. Open Cup and win the USL Championship and go undefeated. So that's also happening in, in these narratives. Preseason, be careful. See, see, now I want, see, now I want a World Cup match 
in nice. Cincinnati, like just a group stage match. They're trying because to I want to see what happens. Yeah, oh, I know. I want it to happen because I want to see what happens when we put two random countries in Cincinnati and give everyone skyline chili the night before the game. Man, I don't know if some countries are going to be ready for that. Get get some uh, get some skyline chili and some huty delight to wash it down with, and get those two mm. random countries to experience that. Yep. Mm-mm. That's that's going to go badly for some people. Yeah. Uh, the, the the World Cup will be infamous forever for this. It could Just be for that one game, the Skyline Chili game. Um, Philadelphia is about to play preseason. Um, are they playing Orlando? It appears uh, they have their lineup posted. There's no live stream. Uh, you can follow the blog, which you won't get everything out of it. Um, Looks like a fairly first-choice lineup. It is the midfield that you would expect out of Philadelphia with Martinez behind Bedoya and Montero and Anthony Fontana up top, replacing Brendan Aronson. The Aronson replacement is not another Aronson yet. He's a little young for that. Uh, Shabilko is up top with Jack DeVries. That one is probably going to be somebody else once you get to the season. Back line... The, the question I have for Philly is, Stuart Finley, does he come straight into this team, or is it Jack Elliott and Jacob Glesnes? Today, it is Elliott and Glesnes with Mbizo on the right and Kai Wagner on the left. Fairly first choice for Philadelphia. Um, they are underway. I'm sure there will be lots drawn out of that one for sure. For sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, Jason Nix, uh, we have not mentioned this one. There is a report from The Athletic that a... San Antonio player is getting a Bayern Munich tryout. Um, if that happens to where he goes to Bayern Munich and skips MLS, then the MLS scouting departments are going to need to look a little bit harder at USL Championship. Uh, I'd love to hear the details of that situation. Maybe MLS teams offered him deals, but maybe didn't offer him enough, and he wanted to keep more freedom to be able to move, and San Antonio offered him freedom to be able to bounce at any point. So don't know. Uh, but that's one to keep an eye on. Um, don't get that one too far out of whack either in terms of overreaction Monday because it's one player, and that does happen from time to time where a lower division player, it's like, oh, wow, how did we all miss on him? He's good. It happens. The, the, the funniest time that happened in the U.S. history was Clyde Sims. Clyde Sims was a Richmond Kickers player who, when the U.S. was having a CBA dispute with the U.S. MNT PA in 2005, beginning of 2005, going into the hex. So they're going into the final round of qualifications for the 2006 World Cup. They had to bring in, because it got to this point, they had to bring in a training camp of non-MLS players who had been part of the PA so they brought in a training camp of USL guys. Clyde Sims, out of nowhere, they're like, this guy's really good. Um, they kept him when they did bring the guys back, like a, maybe two weeks before the first game against Trinidad and Tobago. And Clyde Sims stayed. And by that point, all the MLS teams are like, who is Clyde Sims? Let's sign him right now. And he signed to D.C. And, and became a really good MLS player. But he wouldn't have ever had that opportunity if he hadn't had the CBA dispute. So it does happen where there are gems in the lower divisions. This could be one of those situations. Yeah. Uh, Jose Gallegos, the 19-year-old, was a finalist for 2020 USL Young Player of the Year. Just a little, little detail on uh, Gallegos as he heads over to Bayern Munich for two weeks. Uh, DK is asking about Alan Franco talk. Yes, we, we did talk about it. We were paying attention. Um, there's really no updates here. It is a situation where Independiente is going to need to sell some players. They have another ding on the uh, FIFA list now. It looks like two players and two clubs that are owed money by Independiente. I think they are down to 48 hours, according to uh, Garova's tweet, and I it's a little hard to follow because of all the different moving parts. I think they're down to 48 hours where they have to pay at least the first of these off to avoid a suspension from the transfer market. Maybe you can pay that off if you agree to this transfer on Alan Franco. And, yeah. I, you know, I mean, look, it's business. Like, that's that's the situation. As Independiente's in a desperate spot, they need cash. 
you can give them cash and you want one of their players and they might have to give up a player they don't want to give up. Uh, about the fit, we went through it earlier. He plays in a system and he's played at a club that has not played in this kind of way that Gabriel Heinze wants to play. The first two targets in Martinez and in Gianetti came from systems that played in that way. They're comfortable on the ball because they've played on the ball quite a bit. Franco has not. He, he's played in a different system. So that's going to be a, a period of adaptation for him. He's going to have to bring that part of his game out because he hasn't been asked to do it. Doesn't mean he can't. He just hasn't. So we're going to have to see that part. It's not as straight of an easy plug and play. He'll get it like it would have been with Gianetti because he, he played in it for two years. We'll see about Franco. But he's a very talented player. He's been linked with moves to the LA Galaxy to Club America before. Very talented player who you might be able to get because Independiente is desperate and because he wants to make the move. He reportedly wanted the move to the LA Galaxy. They couldn't get it done. That was all reported back last May, I think. Yeah. Uh, we'll see what happens next. He was linked to the Galaxy, I think, earlier in the year, too. He was linked to Club America in, in 2019, I believe. We'll see what happens with it. But right now it stands that it's being reported as an offer for not 100% of his pass. Um, there would be, I guess, an increased sell-on if it happens. It is a move that you're trying to, to get done because you want to get in another starter. And I think that question has been answered about Gabriel Heinze being comfortable with what he has on the back line right now. He's not. They, they want to go get another starter. Alan Franco would be a starting level talent. Very good player. Yes, you do have to see what he can do on the ball in the system. You want to get him in as fast as you can so you can see. But looks like it could get done. Could is where it stands right now. Could. But Independiente could be up against some deadlines and getting bills paid. So they might need the cash. Wrapping up stuff on the Twitters, uh, Tafka had a question. He says, when Europe reports weekly salary for players, is that considered over 52 weeks or just during the active weeks of the season? It's a good question. I don't know. Um, not sure. Uh, I, would I would believe that is over the full 52 weeks. I think that's generally how they structure it, but I'm sure some people structure it differently. Um, that's my guess. You're the Euro snob, John. Yeah, and my my interpretation has always been that it is over the the calendar year. It's not just a season thing like it is with like National Football League players, where they it's like you get those uh, twenty week installments or whatever. I've always thought it was just the fifty two week stuff. It's over the. It's like a yearly pay paycheck pay scale. Yeah, I believe that's uh, it. Uh, news out of Nashville, Daniel Rios has signed a contract extension through 2022, an option for 2023. And uh, Antonio this morning has posted a picture of grumpy Sam Allardyce face with no comments attached. So it's did another we, one of those weekends we, for grumpy we, Sam and the gravy we, boat where you lose one nil to Crystal Palace did, and you're hurting. Did we really need that? Don't deserve anything more or less. You could have just left that one alone. We didn't really <laughs> need to know that. We really didn't. Did we hit the shout out for Newell's Old Boys for uh, their new manager? Not yet. Not yet. We're getting okay. there. We're almost there. Okay. Uh, That's almost a soccer over there thing. Yeah, no, we'll get, we'll get into it. Um, Kismet says it's time for Atlanta United to become partners. And he puts them in quotes with Independiente like Aberdeen. No, no, no I, I think there's some misunderstanding here. Atlanta United is not, air quotes, partners with Aberdeen. They invested in the club. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, they put money in. Um, that's why it was different than some of the partnerships that you see that are more, air quotes. You can't do that with Independiente because if I'm not mistaken, and I know Gustavo will come in and correct us, um, they're a membership-driven club. I don't think shares are for sale. Um, if they are, I don't know if they are widely available. They might be held by a small group or part of the club might be held by a small group. But I believe they're a membership club and they're run by an elected board. So it's it's just a different setup entirely. You wouldn't be able to do it. Um, but yeah, the Aberdeen thing, it's not a fake partnership. It's, it's, it's a, you invested in the club. You, you bought part of it. So you own part of it. Um, that's why you have some say. And and you should, because why why do you buy part of it otherwise? Doesn't really make any sense. Uh, I'm just going to invest and give you money and not say anything. That would be very nice, but not everybody is that nice. Um 
Wild Charis says Velasco to Atlanta on the cheap. Uh, see, I don't think they need to do that. And, and that's, I think that's the important thing to understand here, and you can't take it out of context and too big. Independiente is not like $10 million into debt where they have to go find these payments immediately. They're, it's a couple hundred thousand on this latest one. Uh, I don't think any of the debts reached into the millions, although there might be one that was low millions. I think a $3 million cash in, in injection here would solve it. I think. I, I don't think you need to then get into the Velasco kind of money where you're talking about, I think, $14 million was turned down reportedly in the, the last window. I don't think you have to go sell that much. So they want to hold on to Velasco because, look, that's the long-term way to fix this, is maybe with one more year or maybe even into the summer – of Alan Velasco playing well, that you sell him to a bigger club in Europe for bigger money. They don't need to do that now. They do need some millions to come in, but they don't need 14 at the moment when they could probably get more for Velasco a little bit later. So no, I don't think it's to that point. Um, Ricky Ricardo's like yelling at me now. He's trying to take over the show <laughs> and like make, uh, make editorial decisions, wanting to show, show things. I think we can do this because it's pretty cool. If you will give me a minute. Uh, Bonyet Garcia re-signed in Houston. Um, and his twins are free kick experts, we found out this weekend, which is very cool. Um, I will show you that here in one second while we get there. Jarrett, you want to tell us about Newell's new manager first? I mean, I can do that. Uh, Newell's have hired a new manager. Um, Mono Burgos is uh, taking over who was, I believe, last at um, last at Barcelona or Real as an assistant. Uh, Atleti. Oh, Atleti. Atleti. Eh, a, I'm going to get stabbed by someone from Atleti. <laughs> Pretty much. Simeone will come after you. Yes. Simeone is going to find me. That's all right. He's got, he's got enough of a reason. Um, but Newell's have hired... Uh, Herman Burgos says their new manager, who always looked like the assistant coach that you have on the field, that uh, that, that, it, that whose job it is to possibly fight if a fight breaks he's, out. He's the he bouncer. The, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. He, he uh, is as Princess Bride did uh, with uh, Andre the Giant. He's part of the Brood Squad. Nobody, you are the Brood Squad. It's true. Oof. That's true. But um, he's been given interviews about the way he sees the game. I really am fascinated to see you know, the way he employs it because he's got a, a Bielsa streak in him, but he's also worked with Simeone for a long period of time, who is not you know, as far away from Bielsa as you might think that he is. Uh, far more pragmatic, obviously, but you know, the way they see the game, the positional play aspects of it, it it's not super different. Um, it's just Simeone will sacrifice the the way you play for the result, whereas Bielsa wouldn't do that. But they're also they've been in different situations. You know, Bielsa's never managed at a club like Atleti, where he could really truly win a league title on a regular basis. And even then, I mean, they're number three in in the three horse race typically with Barcelona and Real Madrid. All right, Ricky wants us to see uh, youngsters scoring free kicks like young Kevin Kratz's, but they're young Bonyet Garcia's. We will try to get that up right now. Let's see if it cooperates. And it's going to take a second to cooperate, and we will get there. Let's fix that. And boom. Youngsters in Houston scoring free kick golazos. That's a bomb, too, from distance. I don't know. Kevin Kratz would be impressed with wow, that. Wow, yes. Kevin that's a, would be impressed with that one. That's a bomb from wow. distance. That's way out. Everybody's very excited, as they should be. From way downtown. Bang. In the left foot, yeah. Huh. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, John. What the, are you for? It's, it's absurd. Um I think I showed the second one, Ricky. Uh, the first one, Ricky has posted it into the chat, and you can check that one out. We'll take one more look at, at this one, the left footer from, from way out into the top corner, it looks like. 
Uh, yes, Houston has already claimed their homegrown rights on him. That is accurate. They have him. He that was top four. Player. Wow. Bomb. Bombasso. Bombasso. Yeah, the other one's in a separate tweet. Um, Ricky posted it. You can share it again, Ricky, and, and it'll be in our Discord for our subscribers as well. Uh, we got a whole other show coming up at 7 o'clock where we'll get more into Burgos. We'll get uh, at Newell's. We'll, we'll get into more Super Classico. We'll see if there was divine intervention on the goal that kept it 1-1. We will talk a lot about the man, Pulga Rodriguez. If yeah, get- Pulga is the player that you need to go out of your way to watch every weekend because he is ridiculous right now. Maybe in the best form of any Argentine player in the world at the moment. No, I'm not exaggerating. He's been that good for Cologne lately. And uh, Pulga's a blast. So we'll talk about Pulga. We will talk about where things stand in the Copa de la Liga. We will talk about what Barcelona does this afternoon. Barcelona's playing who, John? Huesca. Yes, and they're in last place, and Barca <laughs> should cut it to a four-point lead at the top for Atleti. We will preview Champions League. We will confirm that uh, I, I'm dominating the picks of the week again. We will confirm it. Well, John a- rattling papers was supposed to mean something. Yeah, it's the sheet that has uh, all of your wins from this past week on it. Okay. Oh, or losses. Yeah, losses. He's got some of those too. Different names by him though, Jared. I think yours is one. Just, <laughs> just one? Saying. No, one would be generous. It's multiple. Oh, no, no. Yours is just one of the names by it. John's name's there too. Yes, and, and Nick's, yes. Yeah, yeah. Nick's, Nick, Nick's Nick, competitive. Not as much. Nick's competitive. Nick, Nick keeps yeah. me on my toes in these picks, but yeah, yeah. you know, I'm just saying. Whereas um, J- you know, if, we were, going... if we were picking Eastern European games and Russian games, Nick and I would be just leaving y'all in the dust. Yeah, there's a reason those games don't get picked anymore. You know, I'm just yeah. saying. We've got Champions League to deal with. Those will be the uh, four of the six games this week, and we'll get into the rest as we go. Um, the big result last night, we haven't really touched on it in any detail. Uh, John, how much did you see of the Super Clasico de Mexico? Uh, most of it. Uh, was it as one-sided as the scoreline appeared? Uh in the second half, yeah, pretty much after the 40th minute when uh, Martin uh, scaled a couple of floors and knocked in the header that made it 1-0. I mean, it was a dagger right before the half. And then uh, seemed then you had the two goals in very quick succession. It, it was uh, it was Club America, and it was, it was just those last two goals in quick succession were stunning as quickly as they happened. But, yeah, it was for me it was pretty dominant, especially after the 40th minute on. So take the last 50, 55 minutes or so and say yes. Um, we have not talked about Eric Lamella's goal from the weekend. That oh. was insanity. Then, of course, he got red carded in the second half. Good times. Uh, uh. The goal mm. was insane, though. Yes. One of the best I've ever seen, period. It's on that list. Um, the two things we have learned to end the show with, Philadelphia does have the baby blue socks with yellow trim to match their new uh, lightning bolt baby blue kits. They are spectacular. Uh, I 100% agree with this, and I guess it's white shorts to go with it, too. Uh, spectacular. One of my favorite kits in the in the league this year. Also... The best on this day in Atlanta United history today, it is Atlanta United legend Bobby Boswell's birthday. Nice. Bobby Boswell nearly scored the goal. Nearly, nearly, nearly scored a goal that would have won Decision Day 2017 and put Atlanta into a much better spot in the postseason than the play-in game against Columbus, where still one of the best... Zero zero games I've ever seen. Uh, yeah. Back and forth, both teams had huge chances. You lose on penalties, but Bobby Boswell, in his, I think he played about ten minutes in an Atlanta United kit. Yeah, nearly scored the winner in that game. Salute to yeah, the not legend. Like he missed either. It was a great save. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not like Bobby Boswell missed a sitter. No, no. He he did he did everything right. Mm-hmm. It's just the team that uh, that played like that, that ended up uh, 
you know, going into MLS Cup, the year that you had to play on decision day, their keeper made an insane save. Mm-hmm. That happens. It does. It does. It happened a lot I'm in that one. I'm grumpy about that game. No, I that, know. Not, not the decision day game, but that, that MLS Cup. I get grumpy about both. But it, it's, it's the small margins. You know? I mean, it's that yeah. close. It, it, it's just that close at times. But that's, that's why we love this game. Uh, Boswell is, is one of those players that I think we don't appreciate enough in this country. At times, we we only zero in on like the Eunice Mooses and the Christian Pulisics and uh, the guys who who play for the national team and in a ton of games or the guys who go on to Europe and we don't rate the other guys as well as we should. Um, we saw it here firsthand with you know at the end of their careers, Michael Parkhurst, Jeff Lorenowitz, uh, two guys who are incredible American professional soccer players and had incredible careers. Bobby Boswell had an, an incredible career. Um, what he did at D.C. and then Houston, one of the best center backs that we've seen come from this country in the last 20 years. Um, he is. He was just outside of the group that played at the national team level. He was not quite at that level, just outside of it. But he was one of the best center backs in Major League Soccer for a long time. And Boswell's had an amazing career. He's starting to get involved on commentary now. I think he uh, fills in for Eddie Robinson on Houston Dynamo games um, when they get shifted around a little bit working with Glenn Davis. Boswell could be a total star uh, on the commentary side if he wants to. Um, always a great interview, fun guy. His stories are, are, are great about the game. He gets it. He gets the entertainment side of it. But all of that doesn't diminish an incredible career. And, and Boswell is a guy that should be celebrated. And happy birthday, Bobby Boswell. Salute. All right. We'll be back at 7 o'clock for soccer over there. We will have predictions. You guys think about what your Champions League predictions are going to be for the week. I can't wait for the Atleti Chelsea game. That's the one that I am just really, really pumped about. That's the one that I can't wait for. But we'll talk about all of them, too. We'll talk about all the stuff from South America. We'll have a Conca Cinco. We'll get into all of it tonight, 7 o'clock, on the Twitch pitch and on our app. Thanks for hanging out with us this morning. Mucha platio. Mucha platio. Mucha platio.